How are you, the listener? Not you, Mark. I've already spoken to you. I was the literally listener. about to respond to that as well. <laughs> I, I want to know how the nice. listener is today. We talk okay. to each other a lot, but let's address the listeners. <laughs> how are you doing? How's 2021 working for you? How's your mum? She all right? Yeah, she doing well? All right, leave it out, mate. Don't want your life story. Um, so, <laughs> you join us for another riveting episode of Cinematic uh, Twaddle, I think is I the think term. Twaddle, yeah. Twaddle Twaddle's definitely do. the right word. Definitely the right word for, uh, for the bullshit we spell, absolutely. <laughs> yes, and today's uh, theme, as you know, because you've already downloaded the episode, is either Riot Girls or Rock Chicks or whatever we decided on in the edit. Yep, I, we definitely <laughs> planned this out perfectly, down to the last detail. Women um, who rock. Women who rock, there we go. That probably won't be the title, but there we go. <laughs> I just think women rock. <laughs> of course they do, absolutely they do. Yeah, uh, they do. Of, they can. It's, a, it's allowed. It's allowed now. It, it is allowed now. It's not, it's not <laughs> the Dark Ages anymore. Women can indeed rock if they so choose, and a lot of them do. <laughs> So yeah, women in, who do indeed rock. We've got two films that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so we have My Choice, which is Hedwig and the Angry Inch. And then Aiden has got for us. Uh, Her Smell, which is the title of a film. Yeah, I remember when you first suggested this, you were like, oh, have you have you seen Her Smell? I was like, as in like, have I literally seen Her Smell or have I watched her sniff something? I was like, what are you talking about? She smells about? so much that you can fucking see it. So then when I found out it was a rock movie, I was like, well, why is it called Her Smell? Because, you know, I, 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 was, I was a little bit confused. But we can obviously talk about that because now yeah. I know why it's called that. Well, at least I think I do. Yeah, I still, I'm still not entirely clear why it's called that. It's a bafflingly shit title. But we'll get into the movie in a bit. Um, all, all I will say is I had a little look on Wikipedia and something in the summary of the plot actually makes reference to it so i was like oh, okay i understand uh, what's called see, that. we'll um, talk about that when we get into mark it. has revealed there a little a little secret about kino inferno he does research and i <laughs> simply don't <laughs> frankly I he's lucky he's lucky that i watched the films before we start recording i i, I wouldn't <laughs> call scrolling through wikipedia on the toilet research but okay um, I used to do more research, by which I mean on the first episode I did some research, <laughs> but um, we used exactly none of it, so you know I now just freeball it. I mean I've got like a good half a page of Google Doc notes, so I'm I'm somewhat prepared. I've got less than a sentence. But, yeah, to um, be fair, to be fair, I did get to the end of the both movies and look at my my notes page and was like, oh, there's barely anything there, <laughs> which is probably you know probably shouldn't say this sort of thing we're trying to project a professional image so yeah first film we're going to be looking at today uh (laughs) is going to be my choice uh so it's hedwig and the angry inch hedwig and the angry inch late at night i would listen to the voices of the american masters tony tenille debbie Boone, and murray who was actually a canadian working in the American idiom. And then there were the crypto, homo, rockers, Lou Reed, Iggy Pop, David Bowie, who was actually an idiom, working in America and Canada. These artists, they left as deep an impression on me as that oven rack did on my face. So, Hedwig and the Angry Inch is a glam rock musical that tells the story of Hedwig Schmidt, a genderqueer rock singer who has been scorned by the internationally renowned rock star Tommy Nossis, who was at one time Hedwig's partner and songwriting companion. Fueled by a quest for revenge and acclaim, Hedwig and her band, the aforementioned Angry Inch, embark on a tour that follows Tommy Nossis around the country, playing in various small restaurants whilst Tommy plays it to sell out arenas. Throughout the course of the film, we learn Hedvig's tragic backstory and how her real desire in life is to find her other half in order to become whole. Tight summary there, Mark. Thank you. It was originally a lot longer because, as you know, this there's a lot more plot to this film than what I've just described. Um, yeah, it's more, well, to be fair, it's more of a character study than a plot piece, so there's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot more stuff. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah, because, like I said, this is a musical, um, and... The songs very much are kind of... You, you basically have like a series of vignettes between each song, which kind of uh, contextualizes the lyrics of the song, which is a, a method of telling the story that I really quite like. And it's also... Um, 
it's kind of very similar to how the stage show is uh, performed because you know uh, some of our listeners may may or may not know Hedvig and the Angry Inch started his life out as a stage show. I believe it premiered back in 1998, if I'm not mistaken. And unlike a lot of other musicals, um, it's not um, the stage show is performed as if it's a band, like a, like it's like as if you're actually at a rock gig and Hedvig is uh, between songs is doing like a mixture of monologue and stand up and tells the story. So they've okay, really kind of kept that. Yeah, they've kept that for the film, um, and I think that's yeah, one of the reasons why the film works um, so well. You're more familiar with this film than I am. I've seen it before, but a, a very long time ago, uh, before I watched it last night. Um, and I was pretty drunk when I watched it the first time. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, of watching course. it and actually paying attention. Um, yeah, I, that was something that I was, I was intrigued by, because I knew it was based on a stage musical. Um, but they kind of do have sections where they're playing at the various... Um, because <laughs> they're playing at sort of uh, restaurants and things like that. Yeah, bilge um, water seafood restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they do have the, they still retain that thing where Hedvig is just kind of wandering through the crowd and kind of chatting to them, and you know. So yeah, I was wondering if that was part of the uh, stage musical. Yeah, and it, Aston, it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, what well, you may find uh, particularly hilarious, we were discussing this just before we started recording, but uh, they recently brought um, the show back to Broadway, and uh, it was quite a big thing because Neil Patrick Harris played Hedvig. And they modernised it slightly to accommodate for the fact that the show was on Broadway. Uh, so the plot uh, in the Broadway version is that the Hedvig and her band have taken over the stage in the theatre that was hosting Hurt Locker the musical, which closed after a few performances <laughs> because it was such a bomb. Uh, so Hedvig and her band are performing on a, a set of like wrecked cars and just rubble everywhere and stuff. That's cool. Uh, the, bi- the big song from Hurt Locker the musical, I think it's called When Love Explodes. Yes. Which is just a fantastic <laughs> title. <laughs> that is great. Um, we should probably address as well um, we are going to be referring to Hedvig as she and her for the majority of this uh, discussion, primarily because that is how she's referred to in the film, although we should point out that the reason I'm pointing this out is that the film is fairly ambiguous as to what her gender identity is. Yeah, there's uh, there's been a lot of sort of back and forth over the years in regards to that, but um, we're very much kind of going to be going off the idea of what uh, John Cameron Mitchell, who not only plays Hedvig in the movie, uh, but also create like co-created the stage show, um, he's always described Hedvig as being gender queer. So he's never outright said that Hedvig is trans. It's just during the movie, Hedvig refers to herself as she. Yes, um, and we do know uh, from the movie that Hedvig went through a gender reassignment surgery that was somewhat botched uh, somewhat <laughs> well uh, very botched as botched as probably possible to be um yes which left her with the uh the nubbin that we know as the angry inch which is also the name of her band which yeah. is is one of the is one of those aspects of the movie which we'll you know describe in a second but like whenever i've tried to sell this movie to people and say how they should watch it I kind of give them a brief overview of the plot, and as soon as you get to the part where you explain what the angry inch is, they all kind of go, "I'm sorry, fucking what?" Um, like, no, you, you, you have to see the movie to understand. But uh, essentially, um, as is revealed in the amazing song "Angry Inch," um, so in order for, well, I suppose we need to backpedal there because otherwise it's just we're going straight into the botch surgery as opposed to actually discussing what it leads up to the botch surgery. Yeah, um, yeah, we should say that the movie kind of gives you. Um... It is all about Hedvig and uh, her journey uh, from mm. East Berlin to the yes, United States. Yes, East Berlin. Yes, because um, uh, Hedvig started out her life as Hansel, uh, a, as <laughs> she describes herself, a young slip of a girly boy living in poverty in East Berlin, who was enamoured with American rock music that the the she used to listen to on a forces ra- like Army Forces radio station. I think. Yes, because her dad says. was an American GI. Yes, uh, yes, I believe so. Um, and so Hansel kind of grew up and always felt like he didn't quite belong in uh, East Berlin and such. And then eventually Hansel meets Luther, an army GI, who becomes quite a quite literal sugar daddy by leaving a trail of sweets for Hansel to find. Yeah, <laughs> these sections that kind of flash back to East uh, Germany, East Berlin... Um, they're so they're quite bizarre. I thought they're very, um, as you said, there's the kind of fairy taleish elements to them, but there's a, yeah, they're also kind of shot in that very like um, sort of oversaturated colours and stuff. 
Yeah, because the entire film is really quite striking visually, I would say. But mm. yeah, all the bits where it goes back to East Berlin, it's, it's very cold looking and yeah, just, it's very like blue just, filter. <laughs> Yeah, and I think because the things that happen in East Berlin are so unpleasant, because yeah, yeah. it's it's imp- it's implied that it's very heavily implied that uh, Hansel's father molested him as a child, and then you also have the whole thing with Luther, uh, who <laughs> even though Hansel is supposed to be twenty six at this point, it feels very much like grooming. It genuinely feels like yeah. Luther is grooming Hansel yeah, so we by leaving say, a trail uh, of sweets. <laughs> Luther is an American GI who finds Hansel. Uh... Well, completely Billy Bollocks out in the middle of nowhere. Sunbathing uh, just... in a bomb crater, yeah. <laughs> yes, and um, initially thinks that, uh, well, th- thinks that Hansel is a girl, and then sees that he's packing some schmeat. As it's um... the, the bishop in a turtleneck, as it's called in the movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, nonetheless, uh, nevertheless becomes enamoured with uh, Hansel, uh, who eventually becomes Hedvig, of course. Um yeah, that was that's one of the stranger digressions into Hedvig's past. Um, I mean, I kind of love the character of uh, Luther, the sort of uh, this, you know six foot ten black American GI with a thing for uh, girly boys. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's quite a bold character who's only in the movie for all of like what two minutes. <laughs> yes, he's a memorable character. Uh, unfortunately, uh, ends up leaving Hansel for a, a boy. Yes, he does. Uh, so, further on from meeting Luther, um, Luther so, like proposes to Hansel and wants to take him to America. But at that point in time, gay marriage obviously wasn't a thing, and to get married, they would have to both have a full physical to determine that they were both you know, they were male and female. So, I was going to say, I, d- I should have done some research on this. Is that true at that time that they would have had to do that? I'm not entirely sure, you know. Like, but it, I wouldn't be surprised. Hmm. I mean, purely if it was just a case that they'd have to look at like medical records, maybe, right, because a right. full a full examination would be, you know, pretty invasive just to be able to get married. But I, I don't, I, I don't actually know, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. But what makes me laugh about it, about even though the whole scenario is very tragic, the thing that I find so funny, and the film doesn't fully explain this, but you kind of get it as like a visual gag, is the. Uh, Hansel's mother, who who his name is Hedvig, she actually gives Hansel her name because um, they form this plan where if you, if Luther is going to take Hansel away to America, uh, he's going to have to obviously prove that he's female. And his mother goes along with this, saying that she can uh, like Hed- Hansel can take her passport and they'll you know p- paste his picture on it and stuff. And uh, she says, "Oh, I know just the doctor that can do this." So she takes him to a foot doctor. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting the way the film handles this. Maybe this is something we can talk about because this is very much a film from two thousand and one. I think it's yes. fairly, fairly progressive for what it's trying to do and what it's trying to talk about. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything in there that made me kind of go, "Oof, you wouldn't get that nowadays." I think. I it, yeah, I'm with you on that. I think well, kind of what we were discussing off mic. I think what would be different nowadays is that there'd be an explicit reference to. Hedvig's gender identity they'd either be a trans woman or you know a cross-dresser or gender fluid or you know they would use the term and they would stick it down I think nowadays um, yeah I don't think it's a detriment to the film that they don't um, I, I yeah I'm with you on that as well I actually think if anything it t- for me personally it does actually kind of make the film a little bit more interesting because you kind of have to sort of do the work yourself to figure out uh what yeah. Hedvig's sort of alignment is and I I, yeah, I kind of like that aspect to it. You kind of because a lot of the film is about Hedvig exploring the you know her own gender identity and stuff, and you kind of go along mm. that journey with her as opposed to just being outright told this is how she identifies. Yeah, and we're jumping ahead slightly, but I think that the film would kind of lose something if at the end you had a big moment of Hedvig going, "I'm this or I'm that or whatever." Like I think the fact that the journey is more about her finding some kind of peace with the situation that she's in, whatever you may want to call that, is kind of the point. And it's more about her internal journey than it is about... It's not a coming out story, let's say. You know, it's not about saying, you know, I am this. It's about kind of going, well, what it's am about, I? It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's also about, you know, taking comfort in yourself and knowing yeah. who, you, who you are deep down, which is, you know, there's a, a big running theme of the movie... 
is the whole idea that Hedvig is searching for uh, her other half because she very much buys into that belief uh, that humans were originally two two people stuck together back to back and that was you know we were we were originally like one person uh, which and then the gods split them in half and then everyone's now wandering around trying to find their other half mm. and that's the kind of belief that Hedvig subscribes to and that's she feels like she has to find the person that is her other half and again that fuels yes. kind of a lot of the story there's a big musical number on that uh, subject yes the origin of love which is mm. a fantastic song although I, I feel like it just goes without saying but every song in this film is fantastic yeah that's true I, I think the fact that the songs are very um, you know very rock and roll does actually help because they're not um, it, well, there is a certain amount of kind of theatricality and camp to them but they're not like musical songs in that regard yeah absolutely like this is the thing like um, and, you know, I, I, I like a fair few musicals but there are very few of them that I would sit and listen to in terms of their soundtracks that I would sit and listen to just generally. But the soundtrack to Hedvig and the Angry Inch is something that I listen to very regularly because they are just good rock songs. Mm. Uh, like To the point where I feel like if you were to play the soundtrack to this movie to somebody who wasn't aware it was from a musical, you would probably fool them into thinking it was a legitimate band. Yeah, because uh, you know what? When they got to... Um... Oh, God. What, is it called Wig in a Box? Wig in a Box is probably the most... Um, musical song in the film yeah no when we got to that last night i was because i couldn't remember most of the songs f from the first time i watched it but that one i was like i swear to god that someone's covered that and it's been a single that's been played because yeah it's so, the, quite um, a few of the songs have been covered uh, mm. meatloaf covered the opening song tear tear me down that's uh, meatloaf has done that one mm. Mm. he used to do it live apparently fair enough um yeah, no, definitely. I, I need to look that up. But somebody covered Wig in a Box, definitely. Because as soon as that kind of chorus came in, I was like, Jesus, that's so familiar. And I've not seen this film for ages. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling like um, someone may have done another version of that. Yeah, quite a few of the songs are sort of... A lot of the songs are more popular than like st standard musical songs. I know the Origin... I think Origin of Love was released as a single around the time the movie came out as well. So the songs have definitely got a much wider appeal than what most musical songs do. And I think it also helps that in the film, uh, from what I gather, the majority of them are actually done live on camera as opposed to yeah. being lip-synced performances. Obviously, it's a film about a rock band, so therefore that makes sense. But I think if the film wasn't done with live vocals, it would really lose something. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with that. And, um, yeah, th yeah, it's interesting because... I think you can tell that at least some of the songs are performed with live vocals, um, which is not uh, to besmirch John Cameron Mitchell's uh, vocal performance at all, but it has the quality of being a bit more kind of spontaneous and all that. Um, I do think... Yeah, you, you do hear really... the notes that he misses and you do hear like the cracks yeah. in his voice. And I think, again, like I don't think the film would be anywhere near as good if they just had him lip syncing. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really interesting... Uh, this is a weird uh, contrast, maybe. But it's interesting to contrast that to say the musicals of Mr. Tom Hooper, such as Les Mis. <laughs> Any uh, opportunity also... you get to bash Tom Hooper, you well, fucking I just will, think won't they, you? He did the songs, he made them perform the songs live there, and that really detracts from the whole experience. But, I, um, yeah, I haven't seen yeah. Les Mis. I know that's the one where he really went for that. I've seen the clip of Anne Hathaway singing um, I Dream to Dream, is that the song? Is that what she does? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that, and obviously she's good. But she's yeah, very she good. Was I, I wasn't, okay. even, wasn't even aware Anne Hathaway was a singer, so you know I was very surprised. But I've seen the clips of like Russell Crowe and Hugh Jackman and been like, ooh, a bit flatter than Hugh which is Hugh Jackman parts. can sing. Yeah, I've um, seen him and he is good, but yeah. he's not particularly good in what I've seen of that movie. But I've never yeah. seen it fully, so I can't judge. But, you know, I think yeah, having the kind of yeah the the more spontaneous kind of rock and roll feel to Hedvig really works. Um, I also really like the the moment in the Wig in a Box song where it becomes a sing along song midway through. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's the benefit of obviously the movie having been an off Broadway musical before it became a film. Is like they knew that was the sing along song, so they could put yeah. that. That was you know there's already an audience participation song, so they could put that. Because um, they even have a bit yeah where the text comes along screen so you can yeah. Sing along with a, to, uh, yeah. with a wig yeah, <laughs> bouncing yeah. along the words and I believe that's now been incorporated into the Broadway version they actually have the words come up on a screen because uh, yeah. the Broadway version is much more high tech than what the original stage show was the original stage show was literally a band and a headwig on stage 
Mm. And now it's, you know, they have a giant set and production and, you know, proper lighting and stuff. Um, we we sort of jumped ahead a little bit there. Um, but yeah, we as, as ever, we're rolling around all over this movie. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, Luther manages to convince Hansel to have botched gender reassignment surgery. He didn't intentionally know it was, he didn't you know, know it was going to be botched. He didn't be know fair, it was going to be botched. But be fair to the lad. But I do think, you know, he probably knew that this wasn't going to end as well as he wanted it to. Um, especially seeing as they went to a foot doctor. I don't know, he seems um, pretty upbeat most of the time, does Luther? <laughs> yeah, it's very true, actually. He's very nonchalant about many things. Mm. Aside from Hansel when he's naked, that's kind of it. Um, that's, what he, that's, see, that's what he likes. <laughs> <laughs> a girly slip of a boy, that's what he likes. <laughs> um, but no, so the, the procedure is done well enough in order to fool the German authorities, I guess. <laughs> yeah, they kind of skip over the... Um, what exactly yeah. the physical examination would be. Oh, yeah, they, they do gloss over that, and I think, in I think a way, I'm rightly kind so. of okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with them glossing over that, because I feel like, the you know, the just the description of how the sort of botched gender reassignment surgery went is... Is enough. Bad enough. Yeah. It's visceral already. Yeah, and, you know, there's even a, a scene uh, towards the start of the movie where Hedwig's... I, I want to say husband, Yitzhak... Who's yes, they uh, are, one of the they band members? Yeah. Yes, because Yitzhak asked for a divorce. Yes, because um, there's a scene where they're in bed together and they're having sex. Yes. And so clearly, Hedwig's plumbing's all working. Uh, also, Yitzhak is something I really do want to quickly point out. So not only does Hedwig have this band of like, let's face it, pretty fucking talented musicians. <laughs> like, mm. wherever she found them, <laughs> kudos. Um, but yeah, I like how, that, has... how they're all just kind of strange eastern europeans like where do yeah. these people come from but, um, I mean, well throughout the movie you see that hedwig has a, a good uh tendency to find the strangest band members because she forms a band with korean army wives at one point yes <laughs> so that's this tendency to find yes. strangers that, like... that was one of my favorite scenes in the movie where it flashes back to hedwig's previous band <laughs> and they're all yeah they're all korean army wives and they're playing in like a laundromat is it and, <laughs> yeah. um, there's the one Korean lady who's just wailing on the guitar. It's so funny. Um, <laughs> I that think that's one thing as well about this movie. The because when it comes to the conversations now, it's usually the music and the sort of like the sort of gender identity themes. A lot of people don't mention how funny it is as well. It's genuinely it is so really funny. funny. And it, I think it's funny in a way. This is kind of something that struck me when I was watching it. Speaking of the sort of gender element of it, is as much as there's maybe stuff that. Um, perhaps isn't towing the complete line of political correctness uh, within the movie uh the movie doesn't laugh at transgender people in any way which is no, remarkable considering not. the time it came out where you know pretty much any transgender person who appeared in a comedy film was like treated like a freak basically in, they, in they were the butt of the joke a lot of yeah. the time yeah um yeah, the movie treats her like an oddball, but I don't think she's an oddball because she's trans, or at least no, that's, absolutely not. You know, absolutely that's part not, of who yeah. she is, but not the only thing that makes her kind of an outsider. You know, yeah, the the humor comes more from Hedwig's wit, and like yes. even when she makes jokes about herself in like regard to like her sort of gender and stuff, it's always in like a sort of very winking, self-deprecating way, as opposed yeah. to you know, it, it doesn't feel cruel. I mean, Hedwig is kind of cruel to some people. Um, yes, very she's vicious not always and... a perfect person. No, no, but understandably so. You know, you you see everything that she's gone through in her life, and I, you know, I feel like most people would come out of that very bitter and very cynical. Yeah. And I think um, yeah. that's also something that might have been handled differently in, if this film was made today. Is I think the temptation in a more modern film would be to make Hedvig just a victim of circumstance and just an incredible artist and not have the sides of her personality that aren't pleasant or that are a little bit spikier. And I, again I think I that agree, would be yeah. I think that would be to the film's detriment. I think that's often an issue that I have with a lot of films that are trying to be um not just about transgender people but about uh, all kinds of people where they're trying to they're trying to be inspiring kind of at the expense of the humanity of the people involved. Absolutely. If you're going to tell a story about a person, fictional or real, and you're trying to kind of convey something about 
life that that rings true you have to include the elements of people that are not ideal that are unpleasant and you know Hedvig isn't isn't a perfect person and I think that's what makes her more relatable she is um, narcissistic Absolutely. to some extent she can be kind of toxic um, I mean one of the major points of the film is obviously as you mentioned in your synopsis this uh, this other rocker played by Michael Pitt um, Tommy Gnosis, uh, he's uh, Gnosis, yeah, Gnosis, Tommy Gnosis. Yes. He's um, obviously a former boyfriend, kind of of Hedwig's. Yeah, who is seventeen when they meet, which yes, is a little. And is Hedwig's probably, age is kind of ambiguous at that point, right? Uh, Twenty. It's supposed to be a year afterwards. Um, so to it's quickly fill in that gap 20. there. Um, so when Hedwig has the gender reassignment surgery that goes wrong um they fall the authorities and move to america and it's a year later that luther leaves her for the the young twink guy that we see and yes. it also happens to be on the day that the berlin wall falls which is a yeah, real kick in the teeth insult to injury because her whole thing about leaving berlin was uh you know to to leave because the wall was there that was part of it yeah and so you know if they just waited a year hmm you know they wouldn't have had to go you know she wouldn't have had to go through that um and i that's one of as cruel as it is that's one of my favorite moments of the movie because it's, it's so perfectly played by john cameron mitchell as well like he yeah. and then it goes straight into wig in a box as well which is a real highlight of the film in my opinion um but yeah so, and, so her relationship with tommy um yeah he is quite a bit younger it's kind of left ambiguous though how much they are physically involved they aren't, uh, from what I gather, because I'm pretty sure there's a, a line of narration in which uh, Hedvig states that they've been together for a, a fair few months, but they've never even they've kissed. They've never kissed, yeah. Yeah, but then there's also a line where she says uh, in the narration about he's got almost perfect uh, ignorance of the front of me, which I thought was well, interesting. I feel like we... To me, that would imply, um, you know, dirty business up the arras. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, well, then again, that, I mean, we have also just kind of glossed over. I mean, we say like, "Oh, they've never kissed," but we are kind of glossing over the first time we really see Tommy. He's in the bath, and Hedwig yes. walks in and wanks him off. You know, literally wanks him off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which has again one of my favorite comedy moments in the movie, where Hedwig, because um, essentially the way that Hedwig meets Tommy is that she babysits for Tommy's family. Mm. and uh, it's where she sees him in the bath walks in with the baby in her arms and just puts the baby on the floor <laughs> to go over and j- j- jack Tommy off and I just find that so fucking funny <laughs> yes uh, yeah, so Hedvig uh, yeah, not, a, not always the best person I, f- I feel like that's probably the element of the movie which is a little bit more um Quite, in terms of like just her behaviour questionable because of Tommy's age um, but sort yeah. of going back to your point slightly and I don't want to marry that to what I've just said but like in, mm. in like a general sense I, I, representation is incredibly important but that doesn't mean that every single facet of representation has to be 100% positive, positive. Yeah. like it doesn't have to yes. be I mean you shouldn't yeah. villainize these people and make uh, the qualities about them you know genuinely bad but like you yeah. know all people have flaws all people have you know to do bad things or are capable of doing bad things yeah and i think i think it can like you say it can be to a movie's detriment if you know they're trying to you know really push for representation but it's all so squeaky clean and it's like i you know i can't mm. i don't feel like i can fully relate to a lot of characters if they are yeah portrayed as you know i do relate to Hedwig, and... even though her life experience is completely different to mine so yeah I'm i still... can totally see shades of myself yeah. within her yeah and you know, I can see people, shades of people that I know in her as well, and like a lot of that is reflected in the fact, like, yeah, not every aspect of her life is is perfect. Not every decision she makes is uh, totally well uh, well founded. Um, and I thought t- Tommy was a really interesting character because at the start of the movie, before you get into the flashbacks, you're obviously set up to kind of dislike him because you understand that he's taken Hedvig's music or her lyrics or both to and gone on to great stardom and indeed you see that Hedvig and the Angry Inch's little tour where they're playing all these like seafood restaurants and stuff and uh, what is it they played the sort of ninth stage of the uh, the Menzies <laughs> the Menzies fair yeah yeah 
Um, I was watching, uh, uh, my partner watched uh, about half the movie with me last night before she went to bed. And that the, the fact that it was the ninth stage really tickled her. So, <laughs> yeah, because it's literally just a stage next to the portaloos, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's just one uh, sullen goth watching them. Um, <laughs> Who but becomes again, their think, groupie. Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's kind of... Um, it's like a thing with Hedvig as a character. She does pull in these, these people. Um, and we see that that's both the positive and a negative. You know, she kind of... Uh, this is something actually that will parallel with with her smell. I think a little bit is like uh, Hedvig is a character who can kind of pull people into her orbit, and um, absolutely, yeah, for better or for worse, because you see her kind of uh, estranged husband, quote unquote. Um, he's obviously kind of uh, had enough and wants to go and be in rent. Um, yep, yeah, yeah. Yitzhak desires for more. Um, yeah, not only does he uh, want to be in rent, but it, it, again, this isn't fully addressed in the movie. And I feel like, again, like you're saying, if this was made now, I feel like they would make a finer point of it. Is it, it is implied that Yitzhak may actually be trans, but they don't really, they don't really go the full, the full way with that. Yeah, because throughout the course of the movie, we see that Yitzhak is always. Um, admiring Hedvig's wigs and longing for more and longing to be in Rent, specifically to play Angel in Rent, who is a drag queen character. Mm. Uh, I believe I'm not as... Is is Angel a drag queen? I don't really know Rent. I don't. I I believe is a drag queen. I'm pretty sure in the movie, the the poster, when it's the casting call for Angel, says drag queen. There is at least one drag queen in Rent. I can tell you that. And there's numerous gay characters in Rent. I'm, I'm not overly familiar with Rent myself, but... No. No, um, I, I know a lot of people that absolutely adore it, so maybe I should give it another go at some point. Uh, I've kind of heard it's shit, and it's one of those things. Just... <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't mind musicals, but um, I find a bad musical is more interminable than a bad non-musical. You know what I mean? No, I feel yeah. you on that. Yeah, because yeah. because that's the thing as well. Like, if, especially like if the songs are bad. Yes. If the songs are bad, I don't care. And again, I think that is probably one of Hedwig and the Angry Inch's biggest strengths is that the soundtrack is just so good. Mm. There's not a single dud. No, no, no. They're all they're all good. Yeah. But I think uh, it's because they're all written say... with the perspective of songs that an actual band would, would play. Absolutely, yeah. Well, one thing I will say, the Broadway version um, actually, I think, improves the music slightly because uh, in the film version, the song Sugar Daddy is a bit more of like a sort of country number, I would yes, say. Yes, yeah. Whereas the Broadway version, it's a straightforward rock song and I think it's so much better as a result. It just, okay, it sounds better. Yeah. I'll have to listen to I'll, that I'll, version. I will send you a clip. There's a fantastic video of Neil Patrick Harris performing it at the Tony Awards, and it's an absolute belter. I, I kind of liked that it was like a a country type song in the movie because I kind of I thought it kind of reflected Hedvig's kind of obsession with American culture. Yeah, I can definitely see that because it's it's a it's more variation. But I think if when seeing it live in like a band setting, I feel like maybe that song would kind of stop it dead a little bit. Yeah, it true, true. Lose lose the momentum. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah. But it's definitely worth looking up because it's yes, I, yeah. it's it's my preferred version of the song. I would say we got um, a little sidetracked from we were talking about uh, Tommy. Um, yes, played by Michael Pitt, who is apparently a nightmare to work with. Yes, yeah, so I've heard, but we enjoy his presence nonetheless. Absolutely, um, I loved him as Mason Verger. Yes, he is great in Hannibal. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think he's great here as well. To be fair, um, yeah, he is. He's very good. I think what I kind of found interesting about that relationship is that, um, yeah, as I was saying, he's kind of set up to be a bit of a villain to begin with because he is the cliche of the rock star who kind of made it big and forgot the people who got him there. And you obviously have this real dynamic with Hedvig where uh, Hedvig's manager, who's another great character. Played by the amazing Andrea Martin. Yeah, I want to know how that character got into Hedvig's orbit. It's (laughs) it's kind of... Because she is just kind of like... um, no offence to uh, Ms. Martin here. She's kind of just portrayed as a sort of frumpy, random, middle-aged woman. It's just in yeah, the midst who... of these Eastern European queer punks. And you just kind and of... Honestly, like... and, she, and her dedication to them is amazing. Mm. Like, she's yeah. so determined that Hedvig is right. Which, you know, she is because she did write these songs. But it's she stands by her no matter what, and I, that's why I like her character a lot. But yeah, how did she meet them all? <laughs> like, like, well, um, we'll put a pin in that because she stands by Hedvig until a certain point. Um, yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yes, what I was going to say about Tommy, yeah, he is set up to be a villain, but 
every time you see him, he's so kind of boyishly naive about everything. And he seems mm. like there's no malice to that character. Even though there very easily could be. And you get the sense that stuff has gone on between... Like obviously, their relationship soured to the point where he's become this big star and she's stalking him. And obviously, part of it is the public perception issue where when it came out that he had this... Um, as as the headline say in the thing, transsexual lover, quote unquote. Well, I think it yeah. in fact says transsexual gay lover, which yes, uh, it's a, yeah, it's a big headline. Yeah. Which you know that that wouldn't happen anymore. <laughs> no, no. I mean, they're obviously deliberately pointing out that 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 is what. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely that is what newspapers behind. at the time would have been like. But um, yeah, and obviously he's very much he's obviously had to deny her existence for the sake of his career, um, which is obviously kind of the. Which is the real nub of the issue, if we can use the term nub in uh, Hedvig and the Angry Inch. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's the real nub of the issue, I think, emotionally for Hedvig. It's not so much about the the plagiarism as the denial of her even being a part of his existence, you know? Like, yeah, completely. I, I think she'd be perfectly happy being the sort of girlfriend slash collaborator of, of Tommy. I don't think she would have to go yeah. on stage with him to be to be happy and perform with him in that way. I think it yeah, is I think the film does of... make reference to that as well because you you see that when Tommy and Hedvig first start writing songs together, they are still playing shitty little venues. They're playing laundromats mm. and you know uh, restaurants and stuff. Uh, but she mentions in the narration that they play was it like two or three shows a week, and mm. they she earns enough money off of that just to focus on music full time. And she's shown to clearly be really happy still living in the trailer that yeah. she lived in when she was married to Lufa and just, you know, drinking neat vermouth and writing songs. That's clearly where <laughs> she's happiest. Um, and the yeah. fact that, you know, that then gets spiralled off into Tommy becoming this multi-millionaire rock star. I-, I can understand why she's pissed, to be honest. I would be. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's important as well. Like, Tom, I really think it's important that Tommy isn't just a complete prick. Like, I think it would be very easy for them to make him this kind of arsehole character. Yeah, like fame's gone to his head and stuff. Yeah. You, you don't get that impression. You kind of get the feeling that he doesn't... Because when you do see him when he is uh, when he eventually meets up with Hedvig again, you, you kind of get the feeling that all of that is not him. It's all yeah, what it's Hedvig very... has taught him mm. and what's been manufactured around him. Like, even everything down to the style is not him. Yeah, and she's kind of made him into... Uh into that in and is the other thing that kind of i think stings her inside is that she obviously gave him the stage name and she gave him the look that we see later on as well and like everything about him who he is now is her doing to some extent um and yeah and then obviously towards the end of the movie because uh to sort of summarize for the people listening um so as we've said hedvig follows tommy around performing in restaurants that are adjacent to the stadiums that he's in um eventually the band just run out of money and can't really support uh following him around anymore to try and expose the truth they just can't do it uh so hedvig turns back to her old tricks of prostitution to bring in the money (laughs) which inadvertently brings her to tommy Nossus, who is patrolling <laughs> yes. the streets in a limousine looking for prostitutes limo. he just yes. just so happens to pick up hedwig <laughs> yes and there's a great kind of yeah silent scene between the two of them whether it's in the back of his limo yeah that's uh and uh yeah because he gets the cd out and it has like music and lyrics by tommy uh, Nossus. And then he does a little extra arrow and puts you know uh, hedwig and um, whatever their last name is robinson i think Schmidt. at that point Oh yeah, because yeah. Lufa Robinson, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they have a brief reunion. I like how it they comes do. from that to them driving the limo. <laughs> yeah. You kind of go, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, and they're drinking as well. <laughs> yeah, and then they shortly crash. Yes. Yeah, um, and uh, what? Well, yeah, I think again, this speaks volumes about Tommy's character in that he creatively he needs Hedvig because they start singing "Origin of Love" together because they're playing it from Tommy's CD, yes. and he in the recording he gets the lyric wrong instead of saying yes. osiris it's the cyrus <laughs> yes yes uh, or is it just cyrus it's something like that they say the cyrus it wrong. yeah as she goes yeah you singing the cyrus yeah <laughs> <laughs> and yeah then hedvig's like oh yeah you fucked it up you you know we we wrote one version of the song and you fucked it up and it's just yeah. it's clear there that like 
even though Tommy's like a talented singer, I guess. I mean, mm. the versions of I, I don't know if that is Michael Pitt singing in the movie or not. Um, but he's I'm not, not sure. a not an incredible singer, uh, but clearly like a good guitarist. Um, mm. And it's clearly there, like Hedvig is the real kind of driving force behind their music, and that's the point that proves yeah. it. Uh, but yeah, then they, they crash the limo, and uh, obviously they can't really hide from the papers anymore, and Hedvig finally gets um, the recognition that she's been craving for the music. But that doesn't make her truly happy. No, yes. We, we kind of go into um, some slightly more abstract stuff in the movie after this. Yeah, this is the stuff I was looking forward to discussing with you, um, simply yeah. because I, I know some people read it differently, I've always kind of had a very consistent view on what it is, um, but well, what like, you what's say, your? No, well, I'd say what, what would you say your view is? Because I know what um, my sort of thoughts on it are, but uh, I'd be interested in you because you're you're a lot more familiar with the movie than I am. Mm. I've, yeah, from uh, what I, from, I think my take out from it is that so you you have the scene towards the end where um, she's performing in the Times Square bilge waters restaurant which i love that she still plays the restaurant i love that yes. there's such a great little detail and also that's a massive restaurant as well it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> huge uh she performs the song um i just want to interject that some of my favorite stuff in this movie is um when they're playing because the, they are playing various bilge water restaurants right like they go yeah. from place to place but it's always the same uh chain and you, it yeah. always cuts back to people uh just eating their meal and stuff and just <laughs> yeah i love i love the little details of people just some of them are just eating and some of them are reacting like what the fuck is going on uh, there's one point where during the performance she kind of kicks open the fire exit and there's this one yeah. guy who was just eating and then he's like, <laughs> like he was what, fine what with I... the punk rock show going on he was fine with the the uh, well the gender ambiguous drag queen kind of wandering the tables and rubbing a junk in everyone's face but as soon as she kicks open the fire exit next door to him he's like fuck this That's what my, my favourite favorite my favourite gag, though, in that is that um, Edvig's telling the story like, oh, you know, Tommy Noss has stole my songs and he's playing at the arena next door. And it's the, it's such a stupid joke, but it's when she kicks the door open, the sound of Tommy's live yes. performance just floods into the restaurant. <laughs> and it's so loud as well. Yeah. <laughs> like, Hedvig has to shout over the top of it. Just, I, don't, I don't know why I find that so fucking comical I also like um, the gaggle of groupies the three or four groupies that uh, follow Hedvig and the Angry Inch from Bilgewater to Bilgewater there, there is one joke in the movie that um, I, I, I don't know what I've seen the movie quite a lot but I think this is the first time the joke really registered to me and it's when uh, it's during one of the flashbacks where Hedvig and uh, Tommy are first sort of talking about music and uh, because uh, a lot of Hedvig's uh, musical history is based around like you know david bowie the stooges and you know that sort of era of music uh, he plays uh, slightly more for the time contemporary stuff um but he sees shows her bands like boston asia kansas yes. and she's getting very play, tired of these bands. Names, yeah yeah and uh, she just puts her hands on his guitar and says travel exhausts me <laughs> <laughs> that's such a fucking good joke <laughs> Sorry, though, we were um, saying about the ending. We got sidetracked. We were, yeah. There's we, a lot yeah. in this movie. It's a, it's a very densely packed yeah, movie. Yeah, very much so. Um, but no, so then you've got... So um, she's playing the Bilge Waters in Times Square, and she performs a song, uh, it's a two parts, called Hedwig's Lament, uh, which is a great little piano piece, and then it goes into a song called Exquisite Corpse, which is probably my favourite song in the movie, just because it's just a straightforward punk number, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just great. Uh, but during that performance, you know, Hedwig rips the wig off and, you know, removes the tomatoes that they've got uh, masquerading as tits, and, you know, you kind of go into this thing where he's... She's going into a rage, she's smashing guitars, and... Then it just cuts to her talk, like watching Tommy sing one of her songs, and I think yeah, this is where it does become a little bit more abstract. But from what I gather, like this is all inside uh, yeah, her head. It's a fantasy sequence, I'm fairly sure. Yeah, yeah, and it's like a reconciliation between her and Tommy, and it's almost like Tommy's apology to her mm. because the song that Tommy sings to her is the song that uh, she was first singing when she came. He came to see her perform. Yes. Um, and yeah, so it feels like she, like Hedwig not only makes peace with herself in that moment, but also makes peace with Tommy. And then after that, we 
go back to the, the restaurant and now it's in a completely different decor it's very white it kind of gives you that in idea of like heaven i guess yeah which is a bit strange but hedvig isn't wearing the the sort of the female clothing uh she's just stood there in just like a pair of almost like hot pants i guess yeah and then they perform the final song which is yeah she's not wearing probably my s- makeup or anything yeah like yeah well, she's got a bit um, of the makeup still on but it's very um stripped down yeah it's- yeah, and then also got the the cross on the head, which is what Tommy was known yes, for. Like he has yeah. that makeup. Um, and then they uh, she performs the song Midnight Radio, which is another great song, mm. um, and passes the wig over to Yitzhak and kind of like passing off the identity. Like Hedvig is no longer the Hedvig that we knew. Hedvig is now something else, and yes. that's which sort of personified by will the also fact. Also, be a parallel with her smell. Coming soon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Foreshadowing. Um, so yeah, my, my interpretation there is like that's Hedvig stripping away the identity that we've seen throughout the movie. Uh, you know, g- passing the wig onto Yitzhak is sort of saying like, Yitzhak, you clearly, this is what you want. This is, you know, how you want to live your life. Passing yeah. that on and allowing Yitzhak to live as Yitzhak wants to. Um, and then at the end, we don't really know where... Hedwig ends up. We should or... probably point out as well that that is a, re- a reconciliation scene with uh, Yitzhak. Because the yes. last time we saw the two of them interact, Yitzhak was saying, I want a divorce from you, Miss Hedwig, which is funny. but um, Because that's the first time you realise they're married. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, great. Yes, and, she, and he kind of takes the... Uh, he's kind of saying, oh, you know, I've got a, an, an audition with... Or I passed my audition uh, yeah, got play, a part in Rent. To play yeah. Angel in, in Rent. Uh, but then Hedvig says, well, I've got your passport. And uh, there's a kind of tense exchange between the two of them where she ends up ripping up her passport. And that's also the point where um, the manager character leaves briefly, although you see her again later on. Yeah, says, the band kind of splits at that point, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's interesting that what I, she says to Hedvig as she leaves, which is why I wanted to put a pin on it, uh, put a pin in it, was, I don't think you need me to look after you anymore, which I thought was a really interesting choice of lines because i I'm, mm. I'm still kind of that, that's a weird part of the movie that i'm kind of passing out what that means exactly because you know it's quite different to what you'd normally get if we were the scene because to most uh films that follow you know something of an egotistical rock and roller will have that scene right where the band disbands yeah before they get back yeah. together her smell is no different, as we'll cover later. Yeah. The band <laughs> very much disbands in that movie as well. But, um, mm. yes. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, the, the, her angle was sort of, you don't need me anymore. It's not just, I don't like what you've become. It's kind of this thing of, like, you, you know, you, I, I, you've outlived the usefulness that I could have to you. To some extent. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's also referencing the fact that, like, in watching Hedvig rip up Yitzhak's passport, which means that Yitzhak can't do the tour of Rent, is the the manager sort of seeing it as like, okay, this is what Hedvig has chosen. Hedvig has chosen to just do everything out of spite, and yeah, is yeah. so consumed by getting revenge on Tommy that you know she doesn't like their manager doesn't need to be around anymore because the manager was the one that was booking them into play the restaurants and making sure they could follow Tommy around. It's like well, clearly Hedvig doesn't need that anymore yeah, because. Yeah. They're just so committed to, you know, destroying everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah that's kind of how I've always. The scene with the. Uh, um, is it Yitzvig? Yitzak. Yitzak, sorry. Who is played by a woman. Yes, which is kind of, I think, the hint, one of the hints that you're supposed to take it that this is a, a transgender character. Um, yeah. Kind of playing the inverse that... of what a lot of movies at this time would have done. And what arguably John Cameron Mitchell is doing in playing Hedvig, where, you know, you'd have a man play a, a transgender woman, for example. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of interesting that they had a cisgender woman, presumably, playing a, uh, what is implied to be a transgender man. Um, yeah, which we don't fully know, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I mean, that's something as well that maybe in a modern film, the trans characters would have been played by trans actors. Um not that I necessarily think that that's a, a detriment to the film as it exists today. No, and I, I think I think John Cameron Mitchell's central performance is so integral to the film as well. 
they, yeah, I it's feel hard like to imagine it's... anyone else playing the role. Um, mm. And clearly, there's if authenticity is the issue, I, I don't think that's an issue with Hedvig, especially if you compare it to something like, um, oh god, what's that movie? Uh, the The Danish Girl with Eddie Redmayne. I haven't is, seen it, oh, but I don't really like Eddie Redmayne. So. No, um, yeah, the performance in that is. Oh dear, it is a bit of a, a pantomime performance of transgenderism, unfortunately. Like right, that, okay, that yeah. I consider a lot more. And this is me speaking as a cisgender man, obviously. But this, um, you know, I, I find that a lot more offensive than than Hedvig. And I think the thing that the advantage that uh, Hedvig has is that they don't they don't put a button on it and say, "Oh, Hedvig mm, is yeah. a trans woman. Hedvig is, you know, this, that, and the other." Um, yeah yeah it's also that's what's so interesting about that as well is like not only due to the fact that obviously john cameron mitchell um plays him in uh, hedvig in the movie but throughout the stage production's life hedvig has been played by uh like you know, men women trans actors black actors like the the role is so open to mm. having anybody play it yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's the most interesting about it. And I feel like if this film was made today, they probably would pigeonhole it a little bit, and mm. you know, and they probably wouldn't have the scope that the stage shows have, where they've just had all kinds of people from all different backgrounds and creeds just play head. Well, that is because... a benefit that theatre has over film, really, is that you can mm. have a long-running show that will have multiple people play the part, whereas obviously a film is the one article and then it's done. Yeah, like, you know, maybe it gets, think... maybe it gets remade and blah blah blah, but like. You know, a stage production, you can just go, well, let's have one of everyone. You know? Yeah. <laughs> With yeah. The... yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. But I think, yeah, because they don't put such a, you know, a, a firm point on what Hedvig's true sort of like gender identity is, it does kind of allow for that. Yeah, it um, allows more room to manoeuvre, certainly. Yeah. And that also kind of plays into the, uh, the, the very end of the movie where, because uh, you see quite early on in the film that Hedvig has a tattoo, uh, on their thigh which is two halves of a person separated yes uh, so which is their belief of like you know humans being split down the middle and stuff but at the very end of the movie when they you know she gives the wig to yitzhak it's i believe the idea that's being conveyed is that hedvig has actually created her own other half yes like Hed- hedvig is now a full person in, I mean, to how they view themselves at least so they've created two halves and they're now one full person and can live their lives happily and they're now basically giving the opportunity to Yitzhak to basically like I found yeah. my own identity I formed my own path you now can do the same thing and I really really love that moment where they uh, Yitzhak and Hedvig dance together on the stage and mm. it's just it's just so nice is what I will say it's nice yeah yeah that I think your interpretation is pretty much what I took from it um, mm. that she kind of strips down the artifice of what being Hedvig is and kind of finds a more authentic version of herself by accepting that you know you can be your own other half so to speak it's a bit like that children's book the missing piece which incidentally as i was as i was watching this film i did think uh, hedvig and the missing piece would have been a uh, a perfectly fine title for this one too I, but, um, I feel like you know like when you know when they take musicals and they kind of take all the smutty stuff out and put yes. it in schools i feel like that's what that would be <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> But then, if anything, missing pieces a bit smutty of in regard to this film. There is a double meaning. Yeah, that's, ver- <laughs> that's very true, actually. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm glad that we can both kind of agree on that being the. And as far as I'm aware, that's the way it's most commonly interpreted. Yeah. Well, I think the scene, the scene where Hedvig is kind of walking off into the street naked, which I assume is supposed to be a, a fantasy sequence. Is, um, yeah, it's like a rebirth. I kind of got like a rebirth yes. idea from that. Yeah, and I think part of it is her whole identity has become consumed, in some ways, by the the so called angry inch. Right, the idea that she's this kind of, to her mind, um, this kind of slightly malformed figure. I think part of it is accepting herself, kind of warts and all, if that's the the phrase. You know, kind of. Um, yeah, absolutely, and I, yeah, yeah, the walking naked through the streets is very much that. That's literally saying, "Here I am, world. This is what I am. Let's go." And I think it's the perfect ending to this mm. film as well, because it's it ends on a quite hopeful note, I would say. Yeah. yeah. And you know, yeah, Hedvig's done some shitty things throughout the course of the film, and you know, over the course of their life. But I don't 
I feel like the film ends and I don't feel like Hedvig is a bad person. I feel like no, Hedvig yeah. has made amends. I never has, really you know. felt like Hedvig was a bad person watching this. I'd be interested to know if people have takes on Hedvig in that regard. I should probably have looked them up. I do know... That I actually know of somebody personally who really didn't like the movie because they found Hedvig was just too toxic of a character. Uh, they found it hard to really kind of get into it. And right feel compassion Did they for watch Hedvig the whole and... film though yeah because I, I had a brief discussion with them about the ending and and they just thought that like the whole sort of vague dream like part at the end they felt like that wasn't enough of a redemption for Hedvig and I can sort of see that but it's for me personally that's not an issue because I don't the think scene it between... needs to be a redemption in that sense though it's more it is more personal it is more introspective than having a moment where you know, she makes everyone feel good about themselves, or she gets the band back together, yeah. or whatever. Like it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is more of a personal redemptive journey than it is an explicit. And also, yeah. I don't think she's got that much to redeem. The only thing that she really does, in my eyes, that I think is absolutely terrible, is cutting up um, the passport. Yeah, um, that's te- that's terrible. The, the the sort of general mistreatment of the band, like you know, when the I think it's the bass player puts her bra in a dryer. Yes. Um, which, which I don't know about you, but I, I, the way that that shot and presented, it felt very Spinal Tap. Yeah, like the scenes yeah, where yeah. the band are like, like between the songs and between the performances and stuff, like just the scenes of the band feel very kind of like like those rock documentaries. Yes, because you know during that scene in particular, when uh, Hedvig starts scolding the bass player, um, the camera doesn't cut. Yeah, it shoots Hedvig from behind as she you know berates this guy. Uh, I feel like you know it, it genuinely feels like a fly on the wall sort of thing, as opposed to like a general film, and which is mm. interesting because the rest of the film is so highly stylized. Yeah, I mean, I will say that any any film that follows a fictional rock band has the uh, the shadow of Spinal Tap looming over it. I think. Yeah, I'd um, agree. Yeah. It's hard not um, to veer into tap territory with that kind of subject matter every now and then, at least. Uh, absolutely. And there's there's definitely I've, more than a touch of tap to. Uh, Hedvig and the Angry Inch, I would say. Oh, ab- absolutely. Yeah. So, the idea, the just... idea of playing shitty little venues all the time is definitely very uh, very reminiscent of Spinal Tap. And uh, despite that, Hedvig still insisting on, you know, having some form of, like, theatrics and costume changes. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you um, could quite easily have a scene of Hedvig and the Angry Inch playing in the, the very same uh, Air Force base that Spinal Tap plays. Yeah. <laughs> I'd quite like to see that. It's just I just always think back to the Menzies festival. Yeah, that is great. That's a great joke. See, that's the kind of scene. This is what I, I really responded to watching this film last night was um, just how many jokes and details. Because it's not really. I don't know if you call it a comedy. It's kind of a comedy drama, I suppose. But the amount of jokes that they yeah. can layer into one scene. So in that scene, the only the establishing shot is you see this banner. This is like the Menzies Women in Rock Festival or something like that. And that's funny enough in itself because it's Menzies in big black text. But then you yeah. cut to Hedvig yeah. and the band playing the the ninth stage of this festival. <laughs> what well, festival has nine stages? And then, yeah. um, you know, and not only that, they're right up flush next to the uh, the porta parties. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then it cuts to the, yeah, the one sullen goth watching them in the audience. <laughs> Who I'm just assuming, like, I feel like the ninth stage isn't even inside the festival. No, I, I feel don't think like that got that, I feel like I feel like the goth didn't even have a ticket. My <laughs> thing is, I think I think Hedwig and the and the guys brought the stage with them. <laughs> I think yeah. that's their stage. <laughs> Well, because yeah, because when you actually look at the sign for the Menzies Fair, the the bit that says ninth stage does look like a big post-it note. It's <laughs> yes. a bit stuck onto the banner. Uh, I also like yeah. Another detail I like in that scene is that they're performing, and then Hedvig just kind of gives up, sits on the yeah. stage, and motions for the girl to sit next to her, and they just have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> it's also the stage itself is so small that the band barely fits on it as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's why there's so again, many like... scenes, there's so many scenes in this film that are so layered with visual detail in that way. It's kind of incredible. Is this this is John Cameron Mitchell's debut film? Debut film. It was also only made for a budget of six million, which is yeah. pretty low, I'd say, considering like how visually like gorgeous this film is in places as well. I think he must have been thinking about this movie the entire time they were doing the off Broadway run. 
because it's so it doesn't feel like a debut film it feels no, it's, very it's um, made with such polished. confidence mm-hmm. yeah uh, like there's yeah there's like you said there's loads of really cool visual ideas i mean we haven't even talked about the fact that there's animated segments in the film yes which there is we on more than one occasion. That out, yeah yeah so yeah like origin of love is majority is uh of that song is shown with animation because obviously it's about like god splitting people in half mm. um and then you also get it towards the end as well uh when hedvig becomes the whole person that's uh, shown in animation um but for me one of the details that i've always thought was one of the most creative things is uh, during Wig in a Box, obviously the song's performed inside Hedvig's trailer. And I like the the addition of the band coming in and like yeah. the drummer is wearing a drum set attached to themselves. I think that's a cute detail. But it's the finale of the song where the wall of the trailer comes down and becomes a stage. Mm. And I'm like, that's just such a really cool visual idea it that was, I imagine yeah. they probably had for the stage show and couldn't do. I did think the, the band all in their white uh, suits in that scene and then the stage kind of giving away to like this this trailer part giving away to this white stage it was I, I know they're doing this kind of thing deliberately and it's obviously much more before that film came out like there is a sense of irony to this but it did recall Mamma Mia to me <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously I Mamma see, Mia, Mamma Mia came mean. out much later and is unironically doing what uh, you know Hedwig and the Amber Queen is doing. Yeah, I I could definitely see what you mean. Uh, I'm not the biggest they, champion of Mamma They're Mia, going for the camp in that sequence, obviously, because Wig in a Box, which is for my money the best song in the musical, is um. I, yeah, I'm, the, I'm probably inclined to agree, even though as much as I said as much as I love Exquisite Corpse, there's they're been all many fantastic. a time that me and that. There's been many a time that me and my mate have been very, very drunk at two in the morning belting out Wig in a Box. So well, Wig in a Box I is the classic... If this was a Disney movie, and it's very, pretty, it's pretty fucking far from a Disney movie, but Wig in a Box is the I want song, you know? It's the yeah, one that really absolutely. kind of encapsulates Hedwig's character, um, you know, and it's kind of talking about how she uses her kind of identity uh, to sort of hide herself if that makes sense you know she has this external identity that she uses to kind of cover up what's inside and that kind of becomes the major theme so it kind of it's kind of appropriate that it starts in the trailer and then becomes this campy sing-along number um you know it is literally doing that over the course of the the song it's kind of building more and more and kind of becoming Hmm. what starts off as an introspective character song becomes this big camp sing-along number and again, this is just one of those details where it's like, it's so perfect because that is what the song's about. You know, it's mm. about kind of Absolutely. covering the pain inside, if you like, with all the sort of uh, extraneous details and the kind of false identity you kind of build around yourself. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, um, I, th- I mean, we're skipping ahead to Kino or Inferno, but I think... I'm going to have to go pretty 10 out of 10 Kino for this one. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. I can't... Like, I love this film. I really do. I love mm. it on the same level that I love something like Rocky Horror Picture Show, which this always gets compared to. I think this is a better film than Rocky Horror Picture Show by I I would say so. But also, I mean, yeah, I think just in terms of like craft, like filmmaking craft and mm. stuff, like it is a far superior film. But I love I, Rocky Horror, but it's, a, it's you know... <laughs> it is what it is. It's, the thing, it's cheap and nasty. Yeah. Yeah, and, the, and well, this is, you know, Richard O'Brien himself has said that um, whenever he gets asked about Rocky Horror, he always says, he's like, how has something this juvenile lasted this long? Yeah. Because, you know, that is, Rocky Horror is very, you know, down and dirty, whereas Hedvig's a lot more polished and, uh, you yeah. know, it's got, a, a, it's got a lot more ideas, I would say. I think there's just a um, lot going on in Hedvig that I think people of all different walks of life could relate to on some level. Yeah. Like, whereas, I don't yeah, think you have to be a genderqueer rock singer to understand Hedvig's yeah. perspective on the yeah. world you know yeah whereas I feel like you know comparatively Rocky Horror I feel like you have to go into that knowing you know, either having a you know, having a fondness for rock and roll music or horror movies or you know mm. you need something to kind of cling on to in that film however yeah. in the whole yeah Hedvig always gets compared to Rocky Horror I think that just I, I find that a slightly baseless comparison aside yeah, it's from it's a the, bit reductive I think it's boiling down to when Hedvig and the Angry Inch first came out, it was a box office bomb, uh, made 3.6 million on a 6 million budget, uh, which has often been cited, well, 9-11 was cited as being the reason why this film bombed, because it came out at that point, obviously most films that came out around that time did not do well. Um, 
But in terms, I mean, we'll, we'll likely discuss uh, this film on the show at some point. But in my view, Hedvig is not the modern Rocky Horror. Repo the Genetic Opera is the modern Rocky Horror. Yeah, I think horror. that's a more apt comparison. Yeah, they're both down and dirty and they're, you know, rough around the edges, made for, like, no money. Gory, silly, sexy, all that kind of stuff. I mean, Hedvig I, is not I, that. I've always said Phantom of the Paradise is Rocky Horror for the cool kids. It's, it's uh, <laughs> Phantom of the Paradise is Rocky Horror for the cinephiles. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean, that's another, the, the shall, more, uh, shall we do a sort of a, a, a stay tuned foreshadowing? Mm. Uh. It's is it? Uh, if I'm correct me if I'm mistaken, but didn't Phantom of the Paradise and Rocky Horror come out the same year? Er, it's either that or within like a year of each other. I yeah, think. I know. I know they were very very close. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well. We'll get to that another time, but no, Hedvig, Kino, absolute Kino. Yeah, but I mean, can't recommend it enough. It's just a great movie. I can't think of anyone who I know who wouldn't enjoy watching it on some level. Yeah, absolutely. I because even if you don't want to get last night, even if you don't want to get deep into it, but you, can you can watch it as purely, you know, a display of light and sound, which, uh, you know, it definitely works on that level of just being a spectacle, you know. Yeah, it's it's going back to how good the music is as well. I think it's because those songs are so good that even people who probably say, "Oh, I don't really like musicals," could very easily sit through it. Oh, for sure, yeah. But I think the thing that you know it gains is that most of the music is diegetic. You know, it is about a band playing the songs, and then by the time you get to songs that are more like musical numbers that's quite a way into the film so you've got a while to kind of you know acclimatize yourself to uh, the fact it's a musical yeah yeah because even wig in a box which has non-diegetic parts to it they still bring the band in to perform it yeah when it starts off it's uh, more like a traditional musical yeah um and it kind of yeah it doesn't suffer from the thing of people just suddenly burst into song i suppose is what i mean by that because you're either in hedvig's mind or you're in a gig Yes, exactly. Mm. And yeah, I was uh, going to quickly add before we move on to Her Smell that um, I finally, cause watching it for this episode, I finally got around to watching my lovely Criterion Blu-ray of Hedvig that I have. Oh, lovely. Which is gorgeous. It's so nice. It's such a good restoration of it. I, I just mean, rented it. It was a good looking film on DVD. I just rented but... it on Amazon. <laughs> I mean, it might likely be the Criterion version that you saw. Um, uh, it'll be, it won't be, it's... obviously it'll be streaming quality though, it won't be... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fully, um, it's fully even though uh, I say it's a great restoration. This film came out in two thousand and one, so it looked good anyway. But just yeah. it's, but it's it, it the visuals really kind of pop on Blu-ray. I would say. Yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah. I mean, it looked great on the uh, on the Amazon stream anyway. But yeah, I'd like to see the Blu-ray. Um, one thing I will say about this film because I, I wasn't sure when it came out, um, and so I looked it up when I was watching it. And obviously, it came out in two thousand and one, as you say. One thing that I definitely think we can use as connective tissue for her smell is that this movie is such a nineties hangover. <laughs> oh, completely. Yeah, like absolutely. I mean, like especially. Um, I mean, a lot of the music is very much in yes. that. But even though it's a, it's kind of you know it's described as a glam rock musical and inspired by like you know Iggy and the Stooges and yeah. Bowie and stuff, the music has a real nineties flair to it. Not like grunge, but nineties rock. It's, it's all there. Like your man. Uh, Tommy, uh, Tommy Gnosis, whatever it's called, he definitely mm. had kind of twinky Trent Reznor vibes. One hundred percent. And yeah. part of me thinks that might be intentional. Oh, it has to be. That thing he's when when he meets her in the uh, in the limo, that little top he's wearing with the sort of gauzy sleeves. That is. It's very broken era nine inch nails. That came out it? of Trent Reznor's fucking wardrobe, mate. They nicked that. <laughs> Oh. I mean, if you're going to borrow from anybody from that time period, you might as well borrow from the best. Yes, and let's hope he doesn't turn out to be an awful sex fiend. If you don't know what I'm alluding to, Marilyn Manson, look it up. Um, yeah, uh, that we're not going to get into that. But <laughs> <laughs> So, her smell. Memories flirt with death I look ill but I don't care about something she's a woman who's a user <laughs> they're a mother she's a deadbeat a person a persona you're a 
mess. No, you're a mess. Yes, this is Alex Ross Perry's Her Smell, a pungent, chaotic portrait of fictional 90s rocker Becky Something, played by the great Elizabeth Moss. Told over a series of five uncomfortably extended vignettes, we follow Becky as she torpedoes her professional and personal relationships through her addiction, narcissistic outburst and toxicity, until she eventually hits rock bottom and is forced to confront the monster she has become. Very nice summary there. Um, so, almost, I'd say, word for word how I would put this across. Particularly pungent. That's the That was the optimum word there, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, I've read a lot of reviews, and that word came off a lot, so I felt like I needed to uh, include it. Um, a, a, a wise decision, if you ask me. Yes, because there is something very... Um, it's interesting that the movie's called Her Smell, because you could definitely... I feel like you can smell what most of these characters smell like. <laughs> it definitely seeps out the screen, doesn't it? <laughs> and it ain't good, baby. So um, yeah. this is my choice, obviously. Uh, this is the second time I've seen this film. So uh, let's start with you, Mark. As is Kino Inferno tradition, uh, when one of us hasn't seen the film in question, Mark hasn't told me what he thinks of the movie. In fact, I think he only watched it this afternoon. Uh, yeah, I only watched it this afternoon, so it's still pretty fresh in my head. Um but in terms of what I thought of it, I really liked it. Really quite liked mm. it. So I was um, interested in what you were going to say, because this movie, um, from what I've seen of people's opinions, t- seems to be pretty... Um, critical response seems to be pretty positive for the most part. I think there is some umming and ahhing from the few uh, non-critics that have seen it. But, I um, can kind of understand yeah. that. I will sort of... Before I sort of go into what I like about the movie, I feel like there is a little bit of personal bias um in regards to my my feelings towards this movie because it's about um a character becky something that's her name right yeah that's that her stage name, name yeah, yeah. that's her stage name yeah becky something um who fronts the band uh something she which yes. is a good name for a good name for a band and they're clearly very heavily based on bands like hole and babes in toyland and bikini kill all bands that i happen to be quite a big fan of so immediately i quite took to the film because it was very directly referencing a genre of music that I'm quite fond of. So I, I automatically knew where it was going and the sort of things that it was referencing. So I liked that a lot and I, I definitely think you can see that there's a, a basis for people like Courtney Love yeah. in this movie. They're, yeah, they're, they're Courtney really Love is the that. name that comes up in all the reviews. Um, I did hunt down an interview with Alex Ross Perry where he's pretty adamant that the character isn't really based on anyone and it is more about the general uh, vibe of bands that he sort of grew up with at the time uh, he mentions most of the ones you've just mentioned uh he also mentions um veruca salt as well and yeah veruca salt who of, are good the i yeah. imagine l7 probably was another one yes yes um, they did mention l7 quite a bit l7 are great right, who uh yes. just slipping it in because there always has to be a reference l7 are the band in serial mom they <laughs> yes. the, the, the the camel toes is what they go by in that, <laughs> yeah, in that yeah. film. uh i definitely yeah. got the babes in toyland uh comparison though because yeah, a trio of uh, female musicians, and Elizabeth Moss's character does bear something of a resemblance to Ka- uh, Cap Yelland, who is their uh, front mm. woman. So I definitely yeah, saw that I think aspect. They're kind of an amalgamation of all of that kind of nineties. Uh, the the riot kind of girl boxing. movement is yeah. what they call it. Yeah. And this movie, yeah, we should say, yeah, set in the nineties, and very seeped in nineties uh, fashion and style and all of that, but very much not a nostalgia piece. I found. No, not at all. Not at all. I think, and that's kind of interesting because actually, I wanted to bring this up uh, before we kind of get more into the plot, such as it is in this movie, because um, again, it is more of a character study. And um, in fact, I think uh, Perry himself says there's only really five scenes in the movie. It's just that each scene goes yeah. on for like forty odd minutes. But, <laughs> yeah, um, I think that might put a lot of people off, and I think that might yeah, be where it's, the music perception comes from. It's a challenging watch in that regard, but I think that's kind of the point. I think you need to live in the the scenes with the characters and not be able to cut absolutely away. yeah um, completely but what I, yeah what i was going to say is it's interesting because in the interview that i hunted out today and listened to at my day job listeners was um <laughs> uh yeah he was kind of saying that um he felt that what kind of appealed to him about the 90s kind of alt rock kind of grunge punky type scene was that it was an explicit rejection of the kind of artifice of the 80s towards a sort of um authenticity even if that authenticity was kind of raw and a bit gross and made us uncomfortable 
Like mm. it was kind of pushing towards that and away from this very manufactured, very synthetic 80s culture. And I think as a nostalgia piece, her smell kind of reflects that in some way where all of the 80s nostalgia pieces we see these days are very polished. It's, it's all about, remember when you could ride around on bikes and stuff like that, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah, Whereas this is you... very much like portraying the 90s alt rock scene as this toxic cesspit almost. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I recently, I say recently, it was I think it came out about two years ago, but I watched uh, The Dirt, the Motley Crue movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is, is a very fun watch, don't get me wrong. But it's, oh, yeah. like you say, it's so polished and shiny and clean. And I'm like, that's not what that band was. They were, no. you know, they were, the, they, were the, they were the glam metal band that were singing about doing coke and, you know, banging strippers, but they were the ones actually doing it. Like, of, yeah. all the other bands were kind of posers compared to Motley Crue. And the film doesn't, it's amazing that this film is much grimier and filthier mm. than that movie is. Yeah, well, most well, two of the sort of five sections of this movie take place in the sort of back rooms of grotty venues, and you really and do get that sense of absolute yeah, just filth and grot and just general unpleasantness. Yeah, and people like who've spent it's... too much time around each other. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a real ugliness to this film that I liked a lot. I, I I like the fact that this wasn't glamorizing a rock and roll lifestyle. It was showing it for what it actually is. Yes. And yes. Which that's is one the, the important. I think one part of the main of impetuses of the film is to kind of sh- yeah to kind of take the shine off that rock and roll lifestyle and kind of go actually what would it be like to be like to be around someone who is living that kind of rock star persona of being totally fucked up and constantly bucking against everyone. Like, what would that actually be like? And the answer that the film kind of comes up with is, well, that person would be sick, right? Like, yeah. that person would be kind of... Well, I mean, Elizabeth Moss's performance in this movie, she's like feral, practically. I, I've always said that she's a powerhouse of an actress anyway, mm. but this might be my favourite performance of hers. Just yeah. because she just so she gets so into it. Sadly, I believe she's a rock star. Overlooked at the Oscars, despite Perry's best efforts. Uh, Has she ever won an Oscar? I don't believe so, but uh, apparently Alex Ross Perry campaigned as hard as he possibly could with his limited resources to get her nominated for Best Actress. But, um, Rightly so, I'd say, because she really throws herself into this role. And I, I'm i not aware whether or not she was a musician prior, but from what I can tell, she's playing her own music and singing in this film as well. Yeah, she she is playing. I'm not sure if she was a musician prior to this, but that is her singing and her... Um, guitar work definitely and she plays piano at one point as well she does an entire yes. song on a piano which uh, was impressive i have to admit because you don't typically tend to see that in movies when you see actors playing musicians mm. they're typically miming so yeah, yeah. to see her actually perform a full song at a piano was actually quite refreshing i thought uh yeah i, I think uh, just as a side note apparently the most musically talented member of the cast prior to uh, the shoot was uh, cara delavine apparently she's very um musically prodigious according to alex ross perry she, she can play the drums which she plays in the movie and yeah, she, she plays play guitar, guitar at the end as well guitar yeah. and piano and all sorts yeah yeah um, that's interesting i never knew that about cara Delevingne. yeah there you go um yes yeah, so we should probably in order to talk about this film properly we should probably uh, there are five distinct acts which is one of the many uh, shakespearean connections in this particular film um so we should probably go through those so we kind of have act one where we open with uh something she playing what seems to be a fairly successful gig um and you know they're doing they we open on their sort of encore um but they're covering another world another planet and uh you know rocking the joint and then we promptly go uh, backstage and see the just abject chaos that they're, that they're living in when they're off stage yeah, the first thing that struck me is that as soon as they come off stage, like the, the performance element is pretty like standard for what you'd expect for a band mm. like that. And then as soon as they go backstage, all of a sudden there's a baby, which yes, immediate red flag. Yeah, Becky's, uh, <laughs> Becky's much yeah. neglected daughter here. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then, but what the thing that stood out to me was that, because we do eventually find out that that is Becky's daughter, but Becky's not the first person to pick her up. No, She's handed to another, yeah, first, yeah, yeah. The, you know, which immediately I was like, okay, so this is the kind of character that we're dealing with here. And again, well, that's I feel what like... makes that initial sequence backstage so tense as that baby's going 
from person to person to person to person to person. Yeah. And you just and, uh, again, I feel like, again, that is a, an overt reference to Courtney Love and Francis Bacon. Oh, for sure, like that's, yeah. For that's sure. an overt reference to that. Uh, mm. But yeah, no, that's... And that's, again, like like you say, the, the baby constantly being passed around is like... It's the, the scene winding up to the big finish. And yes. that's what all five of these scenes, uh, points of the movie are. They mm. escalate and then they, until they reach a point where they just, you know, they burst. And I think that's what I liked a lot about it was every time we went to a new part of the film, I was like, okay, where's it going next? Like, what's the next big thing that's going to happen? And yeah. it kind of kept me really invested in that regard because I was like, how, how much lower can this character go? Like, what more horrible things can she do? Do and say as well, because this is something we should we should shout out about Elizabeth Moss's performance is she is pretty much on a constant monologue for the first kind of three acts of the movie. Or for when she's on screen for the first three acts of the movie. Becky something is just constantly spouting off just this stream of consciousness of And a lot of it's just nonsense, nonsense, nonsense as well. Yeah, a lot of it is nonsense and a lot of it is these kind of barbs that she disguises in flowery language and she's yelling screaming but then one minute and then the next minute she's kind of up close and whispering and being really malicious and it's like i said it's like, it's like you've just thrown this like feral creature into the midst of these fairly ordinary people yeah she um, is a woman possessed for a lot of this movie yeah and it doesn't help that she also has her shaman the, yes, the, yes. You know, again, that was a red flag. <laughs> yeah, the shaman and the baby. Uh, yeah, it's not a. That's not a combination. Yeah, she's trying to get her other bandmates to do like. I, I, is, is it supposed to be like vision quests or seances? Yeah, they, or something? they keep it pretty vague about what her kind of weird quasi religion is. But yes, I think it is supposed to be. Um, yeah, some kind of vision quest. Because she yeah, talks about she, seeing visions of like a spiritual realm and stuff. Yeah, she, I believe at one point in the film she does say the word seance. I think. Yes, she um, does. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that's um, in the yeah in that sort of first act she is kind of yeah when they go back there she's trying to sort out, sort out this ritual this seance, but people keep bothering her with such uh, annoying trivialities as her daughter, and, <laughs> uh, and the yeah, great dance. Can we give a shout out to Dan Stevens as well who is in this movie? Um, yes. Uh, him coming in with the divorce papers um yes <laughs> and uh, yeah it's kind of funny because he comes in with the divorce papers and his new wife or his new girlfriend rather i suppose because they're not divorced yet but yeah. um who of course becky's immediately hostile towards but then several acts later we see this book and is still trying to get these divorce papers signed. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> you know <laughs> becky's just she's just on one in her vision quest yeah, rambling at people says, <laughs> even says to Becky's mum when she turns up later, like, I've just been trying to get her and this file in the same room for ages. Um, but I thought one thing, since we we're introduced to um, to Dirtbag Danny, as he's known, or as yeah, he was... He's a, he's a radio known. DJ, isn't he? Yeah, it? he's a radio DJ, yes. Uh, what did you think of that character? He's kind of he's kind of an interesting one, isn't he? Because you can tell... They don't really go into the history of them. You just know that they mm. are married. He wants out. And they've been estranged for some time, it seems like. But, um, f- you know, obviously first, they have a kid together. Yeah, at first I was like, he was just kind of there. And I could mm. see why he, what he was doing. Like, you know, he had the divorce papers and he had the kid and stuff. And he wanted to move on with his life. But you can definitely tell, especially due to his, like, nickname as well. And the fact that he was in, like, the radio, uh, he's a radio DJ, is that he clearly loved a version of Becky that isn't there anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, he, he loved the old version before she was just this monster essentially yeah. because th- th- that's how i j- would describe her she is pretty much a monster yeah she is monstrous throughout this movie uh, apart yeah. from till, till we get towards the end he's of course yeah and maybe I think that's... sort of learns the error of her ways but i do think that's one of the strengths of elizabeth moss as an actress is that i never found this character unlikable yeah you probably she is... because she's so good she's very well, charismatic yeah. i yeah. think you do understand how she manages to pull people into her um, orbit, as we're kind of saying with Hedvig, but um, I think Becky's something is, is monstrous, whereas Hedvig is troubled. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, because like you know, it, it, yeah, Hedvig is shown to yeah definitely drinks more than she should, whereas yeah. Becky something is just a fiend for drugs but and interestingly, alcohol. Interestingly, and... you only see her drink a couple of times, and you'd never see her take drugs. 
You see, other you people don't. are shown, to, shown taking drugs explicitly on camera, but you're never given an explicit, like, she's off her tits on coke, she's off her tits on this. No, but that's definitely there. Oh, no, it's definitely there. I, I think my, my point with that, I think, is it's interesting what uh, Alex Ross Perry chooses to focus on in this movie. Because I think another mm. movie would have would have shown the dramatic, oh, she's shooting up in the bath kind of scenes. Yeah. Or you have, you know, and again, with, with uh, Dirtbag Danny... You don't um you don't ever find out what their relationship was prior to the movie starting. It's just yeah. implied. And it's in the way that they bounce off each other. And you can see that he's very concerned about her, but you can also see that he's you know he knows what she is, he's disgusted yeah. by her. But but also he, he is the one who has the most faith in her to some extent, as is, is another interesting angle because all the other as much as he's you know rolling his eyes out and saying all this stuff about her when the other characters say oh how did you get suckered into this again you know he's always he always comes back he does always you know uh, we'll we'll kind of go through the structure of the acts i think before we start freewheeling so we've got that act which is they play the gig they go backstage this ritual is about to be performed this baby's going here there and everywhere amber heard shows up which is just what you need in the middle of a drug binge um (laughs) Looking. I was waiting for the bar about <laughs> Amber Heard. I knew there was going to be something. Look, all I'm saying is, it. all I'm saying is, you know how fucked Elizabeth Moss is in this movie because Amber <laughs> Heard is a voice of reason to her. That's, that's very true. That's all I'll say about that. Yeah, because she's playing a musician. Uh, Zelda is her name. Yeah, Zelda uh, Ezekiel. Yes. Yes. Uh, who at the beginning, well, during this scene where like you know the baby's going to from and all over the place, mm. um, something she are being offered a support slot for Zelda, which kind of kicks off the big sort of conflict in that scene. Yes. In which uh, because Zelda used to support the, or has done support for them, so and Becky now they're will not have her, it. Yeah. yeah, Becky will not yeah. have it. Even though the the uh, the bassist. <laughs> it's me, the fat checking goblin. Just dropping in to let you know that the boys are going to refer to the character of Marielle Hell as the Scottish bass player throughout this section. Despite the fact she is clearly from the north of England, just like her actress Agnes Dane. Silly boys! Maybe they should clean out their dirty little ears. <laughs> Back to the show. The Scottish bassist and the drummer seem fairly up for it. Um, yeah, Becky's having none of that. Um, yeah, and basically all of that comes to a head. Oh, we were also introduced to Eric Stoltz's character as the uh, manager slash record uh, label head kind of yes, guy. Yes, Howard. How- Howard, yeah, of course it's Howard. Howard. Yes, yes. <laughs> what a uh, what a guy. Um, I, I mean, sick I, of everyone's shit. <laughs> I love to see Eric Stoltz. Like you know, when he shows up, I love to see him. I both loved and hated his character because I loved that he was he you know he'd been in the game for so long and he he mm. knew what Becky was, but yes. it's the fact that every single time she does something wrong or offends him or offends somebody around them, he's always talking about how you know I'm gonna lose my beach house. I'm like, oh fuck right off, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fuck yeah. right off with that yeah, bullshit. <laughs> it's, uh, well, yes, he is one of the many kind of manipulative characters in this movie. But again, I think what's kind of interesting about this movie is you know he's never a complete villain. I think in a lesser no. movie, he'd be the one getting her hooked on the drugs. He'd be the one who, you know, it'd be explicitly his fault that her ego got out of control. Whereas in this, they, they give you enough, and you show enough of their relationship that you understand what they kind of saw in each other as business partners and where it is now and, like, how he tries to keep a lid on her antics. But, you know, she's such a live wire that he can't even... Uh, and the thing is, you see him talking to Zelda as well, who he's also in charge of, yeah. and kind of saying, like, look, we'll come back, we'll talk about it again, I'm, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it when she's less in this frame of mind. And you see him constantly trying to put out fires left, right, and centre. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although I will say, I know we're jumping forwards in the act structure here, but when we get to the gig towards the end, uh, in fact, the final gig we see in the movie... And he jokingly says, oh, have we lost Becky already? And the yeah. other two girls look at him with that face. The way his <laughs> just face like, just uh... drops is one of the funniest <laughs> bits of the movie. Where he just goes, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we'll quickly get these structures mm. laid out. Um, yes. So it's worth pointing out as well that in between each of the acts that we see, we actually see... Um, 
uh, camcorder footage from when the band were at their peak popularity. Yes. Uh, when they were, you know, they were getting gold records and stuff. Mm. So that that and they I were quite enjoying liked being in each other's company as well. Yes, so. they actually, you know, they were a band. Uh, they weren't just a bassist, a drummer, and a fucking monster at the front of it. You know, there was there was a genuine like camaraderie to them. Whereas now, she's very much become the. And they were successful as well. They had gold records and stuff. Yeah, exactly. They just really had like a degree of success, and you know, now they are literally just this fractured unit that are barely clinging on to any kind of acclaim that they once had. Yes, and um, so in terms of the structure, obviously that's kind of the um, the little coders of each act are those kind of uh, grainy kind of uh, home movie type footage of the band just being in their younger days, kind of enjoying themselves and. Uh, I do like that they um, they get a gold record and instantly break it because they get you know it's in the it's in the glass uh, casing they instantly yeah. break it and then uh, steal another glass case and just pop the record yeah. out and run. Um, and again, that's just so perfect for those characters, I think, because there's like yeah, a mischievousness yeah. to that. There's no like real malice to it, I think, and I that mm. I felt that was really important to show that they actually used to have fun together. Yeah, yeah, I think it also shows the start of what Becky eventually becomes, where she is this anarchic force and it is this, oh, I'm having fun and all this. But then that quickly becomes a toxic version of that. Yeah, it goes too far, absolutely. she's constantly acting out and constantly, you know, like a big, feral, overgrown toddler almost. <laughs> and the way they all treat her as well in the scenes where she's off her nut is like, yep. they're, talk- they- they're having to handle a difficult toddler. <laughs> yeah, they're put- like, they give her like a, a time-out room and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the second of these like scenes um, is yeah, we where... should say the first scene, the first act ends with the uh, her and the baby going ass over tit onto the floor. Right? <laughs> she she does fall over, holding her child, and vomits all over herself. Yes, <laughs> which is shocking, frankly. Yes, <laughs> like frankly, I did not see that coming. It's uh, very, well, I it's... should have seen that coming. Yeah, and it's kind of as as we say, it kind of is the end result of this sort of game of pass the baby that's going on throughout that sequence. Yeah, it shows that even though Becky is definitely the worst of everybody, everyone else is still quite careless and is sort of wrapped up in her shenanigans as well. Like, that baby should just not be there. The baby shouldn't be there. And yeah, uh, Dirtbag Danny shouldn't have brought her along, but... Yeah. Uh, but then he's also brought his new bird along as well. And he's yeah, going, so... Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, like, definitely in that first scene, you can tell that Becky is, you know, on the verge of fully unhinged, but, mm. you know, the environment she's in is definitely not doing her any favours, and the people yeah, around her... because her bassist is going off with her girlfriend and doing coke in the toilet and stuff. And yeah. There's general carnage all around. Yeah, they're definitely, like, they're in the swing of the rock and roll lifestyle, and they're, mm. they're definitely in the hangover part of it by that point. Yes. Yeah, and you're so starting to you're see s- the tensions form as well between her and the drummer. Because the drummer quite fancies mm. doing Zelda's tour, whereas Becky's yeah. like, nah, fuck you. So then you go into the second scene after they've rejected doing the tour with Zelda, where uh, something she are in the recording studio working on their new album, and we soon find out that the... Or not al- working the- on their new album, as the case may be. Yeah, uh, mm. they've been... They should have been out of the studio a lot sooner as uh, the as Howard is uh, having his new group take over yes, the studio the, space. The Acker Girls. The Acker Girls who uh you've got Cara Delavine, um Ashley Jensen the as the other one. As one Ashley of the Benson one. And... Ashley Benson, not Jensen. Somebody uh, else. Who is the other one? Virginia one them, Madsen. One of there them is go. is it Virginia is actually Cara Delavine's girlfriend in real life? I think so. I'm not entirely sure. It's either Ashley or Virginia. I think it's Virginia. Because uh, say that's obviously quite an interesting casting choice. Because they they are shown to be lesbians in the film, aren't they? Yeah. Well, they're making out backstage at any rate. Because uh, there, there is the bit where uh, we, again we're getting ahead of ourselves. But another one of my favourite little uh, humorous moments in this is when they're kind of uh, waiting for the gig they do after this recording session with the Acker Girls. And uh, yeah, Kara and the other girl are just making out for the drummer for something. She's there going, uh, "Do you guys want to jam?" Or I don't know what your process <laughs> is. Or just make out, I guess. <laughs> uh, it was it was Ashley Benson who was Kara Delavine's girlfriend. Oh, at the time Benson. Of okay. It was Benson. Yes. Um, Benno. So yeah, so the Acker girls turn up, and 
immediately alarm bells start going off because you know these are the the younger, newer, shinier versions well, of what they something she wants they show were. up as the drummer is leaving. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes as the drummer for something she is leaving because it's just gotten too ridiculous too toxic uh becky's refusing to leave the studio um you know it's all getting uh it's all going a bit pete tong but yes then the uh the Acker girls show up and yes it's an interesting scene because they're initially almost uh worshipful of becky aren't they they're kind of um yeah, they admire towards her, her and and yeah, like she, like definitely something she is an influence on them, mm. and you know they're they're kind of like the new blood. And uh, yeah, we should that's... say as well with regard to the uh, with, it's important for the scene. I think um, they do mention it's a detail I didn't catch the first time I watched it, but the Scottish bass bass player of something she, she does say um, they haven't seen Becky in the studio for uh, something like a week, but then she turned up mm. at two a.m. in the morning prior to this scene, and she's been there since two a.m. in the morning. So you yeah, go, which yeah. likely explains her terrible guitar and playing and singing yes. at the start of the scene, which is just so strung out. Yes. Um, so yeah, you know, arguments amongst uh, something she break out. Uh, the drummer decides to leave. So, uh, then the bassist point, the decides to do some coke. A lot of coke. She yes. does a lot of coke. <laughs> she is doing some serious bumps in the bathroom. And Becky's response to the Acker Girls at first is very confrontational and then switches as soon as she hears the music mm. and realises that she she doesn't need her drummer. She she has three new music uh, musicians that she can puppeteer and mm. it immediately just sort of takes control and starts to try and consume them. Yes. Uh, which I really didn't take to because I was like, wow, this is just very predatory, isn't it? Um, yeah, so it's how she turns telling. on the dime immediately as soon as she realises they love her yeah she just yeah. knows exactly how she can exploit them and mm. and then as uh becky starts taking control and tries to have this little jam session with the acker girls uh something she's bass player also decides that she's had enough yes. and well yes she's they, come to, as well. they come to well they almost come to blows in fact they do come to blows she, the bassist does uh, strike her across the face at one point she does yeah but um what what seals the deal is that when she uh so there's a great scene where she makes the Acker Girls play uh, one of their songs. And, you know, there's that there's that long kind of cl- it pushes into a close-up of Elizabeth Moss watching them play. And you clearly see that thing of, like, she knows she's uh, on her way out and these girls are on the way in. But she's kind of... She's decided she's going to latch onto them. But then the thing yeah. that really seals the confrontation with the bassist is she goes... Uh, she's something She asks, like, who, who wrote the song and says, oh, you know, we all kind of pitched in. And then she says, like, oh, well, I've always wanted that, but, you know, I, I've always had to rely on just me to write the music. It's just me. And, I, um, I said earlier that I never found Becky truly unlikable, but thinking back on that scene, no, no that's definitely where yeah. she's a, a cunt, if you ask me, <laughs> which is a word that they often use to describe her in the movie. So. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, because there's another great line from this kind of act is when the bass player says, uh, you're never properly acquainted with Becky something until you want her to fuck off. <laughs> 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 In the uh, yeah to the Akka girls, um, yeah yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting interplay because that relationship becomes uh, between Becky and the bass player becomes kind of a cornerstone of uh, the movie later on. Mm. And uh, so so that act kind of leads into um, the Akka girls. I believe have asked something she to open for them. That's how that's working. They have asked Becky to open for them. But the whole band like is doing there. Like- uh, the bass player isn't there. It's just the drummer and it's just the drummer. Yeah, that's right. It's the drummer. So it's it's basically like they're treating it as like a Becky solo set, but the drummer from something right, she yeah. is going to be playing drums for her, or at least that okay, was my yeah. understanding of it. So the yeah, Acker they girls kind of, they leave it a bit ambiguous, but essentially they're she's opening for um, the Acker girls in some capacity. Yeah, and it's supposed to be like a solo slot. And when we first come into that scene, um, Becky was supposed to be on stage 40 minutes ago and is nowhere to be found. She's doing what's known in the industry as an Axl Rose. Yes, um, <laughs> and the you know, the Acker girls are getting pissed off of her because they've given her this chance to you know have a support slot and still sort of cling to any semblance of a career that she has. And you mm. know she's 40 minutes late and everybody's sort of losing their minds a little bit. I um, think it's, it's, it's either Dan or Howard has a great line of a don't set your watch to Becky time. Yeah. Uh, and not only um, is like Howard and the Acker girls there, but Dan is there, still trying to get Becky to sign these fucking divorce papers. <laughs> yeah, God love him. He's trying. And, 
And Becky's mum is there as well, you know, yes. trying to show some support to her daughter. Because between the second and third acts, we see a little part where um, Becky's mum is there with something she, and she's talking about how she never missed a show and she was always really supportive. And mm. that obviously then leads into us seeing what Becky's relationship with her mother is like now, which is pretty fucking shit it was <laughs> cold to say the least yes yeah i thought that was um, kind of it's intriguing again because this is a movie where they don't tell you a lot about what's happened prior to the start of the film that's a really interesting hmm. choice because you definitely get the sense that something went on in the family home the father isn't around and that's a notable absence and i think they briefly refer to the dad but um i think he comes up in conversation but it's never a huge yeah deal so you get the At sense that there's something going on there. And I think a lesser film would have specifically been like, this is the trauma. This is why mm. she became what she is. But I think what's more interesting about this film is that it's not really about that. It's about she is this and how the people around her are reacting to it. Um, and ultimately, can she pull herself out of it? And I think the scene with the mother is very exemplary of that because in a lesser movie, the mother would come in and be an absolute villain. And yeah, and she's not no, at all. Yeah, she's not at all. She's perfectly nice. You don't really fully understand what the animosity between the two of them is. Although, you get a sense, you know, uh, we find out later on that Becky was pretty young when she kind of got into the whole rock and roll lifestyle. Yeah, I think they say that she was 16 when something she first sort of... Yes. That was her like, first incarnation. She talks also she was in bands previously as well. Yeah, and we're not entirely sure how old she's supposed to be in the film. Um, obviously, Elizabeth Moss is in her late thirties, but um... yes. Um, so, but but she, you know, Elizabeth Moss doesn't really look her age, so no. it's never, yeah, it's never like apparent. But like, yeah, she could be of any age essentially. Well, I think that's kind um, of what makes it interesting to have the the younger band, the Acker Girls, turn up uh, later on, and they're obviously all in their early twenties, uh, playing slightly mm. younger. But um, I think what's interesting about that is Elizabeth Moss and the bass player of, uh, well, in fact, the entire Something She don't look their age until they show up and then you yeah. suddenly and then you suddenly go oh yeah these are people who are approaching middle age <laughs> compared to <laughs> the, and not in a derisive way but in a way where you go oh right they shouldn't be living the way they're living now because they're mm. living like you know party girls who've Absolutely. got their entire lives ahead of them but they really at this point it's like you should be finding your little niche and kind of exactly yeah yeah and i think you know the one of the things i really quite like about um the uh, particularly elizabeth moss and uh, the other two actors is that the there's not a whole lot of vanity in this movie like no. they they really do look as if they've been through the ringer and they really <laughs> yes. kind of commit to that mm. look and that style and stuff and uh, there's always just a quality in acting i always really enjoy is like a lack well, of vanity yeah and this film elizabeth has moss especially spades. is just gurning and growling and spitting and just yeah like she always looks like if you touched her your hand would be dirty afterwards like, that's what she always looks like yeah, um courtney love energy um yeah <laughs> so, yeah so so yes this, penicillin uh, this, shot afterwards. this kind of third act we'll, we'll breeze through the acts and then get back into a general yeah, discussion yeah, yeah. Thing. so the third act uh, as we were discussing uh, becky's 40 minutes late for this slot when she turns up she's got a camera crew following her around she's off her tits she is playing it up to the camera, and basically tensions rise to a point where, uh, well, they're debating whether she's going to go on, whether she they should not let her go on, and all this. Tensions rise to a point where she breaks a bottle and fucking cuts the uh, the former drummer of something she, then runs out on stage and starts dribbling shit to the crowd, uh, before being forcibly removed from the uh, from the venue. Uh, we then flash forward a considerable amount of time. Uh, she's been through rehab she's kind of all alone in a, a big country house and um you know dirtbag danny he comes back uh he finally gets her to sign those fucking divorce papers uh, finally when she's sober she agrees to it <laughs> but we see that she's starting to build a relationship with her daughter but that she's timid and kind of a shell of her former self i think it's safe to say yeah yeah absolutely like she doesn't have that personality anymore mm. she isn't becky something anymore and then the final act is, uh, well, she gets talked into doing a, uh, not exactly a reunion gig, but it's kind of a one-off performance because they're celebrating 20 years of Howard's record label, right? That, that yeah, thing. so something she are playing one song. That's it, just yes. one song. And you have this incredibly tense build-up to that where there are people doing drugs in one room and you're kind of, 
I found this scene real. This was the tensest scene in the film where yeah, you don't absolutely. know what's you really don't know what's going to happen. Um, yeah, and but given eventually, what happens previously, you know that this is a film that can go off the rails so quickly as well. Yeah, um, and they really eventually, play on that. Eventually, in the final you act. see that um, she kind of does a little séance with the uh, with the Akka girls and with Zelda and with the something she band members, and then they all get on. She pulls them all up on stage to play the final song, and um, that's pretty much where we leave it. We kind of leave it with her deciding that. Well, in fact, we leave it with a great final few lines where they perform all together and um you know howard comes out and says oh they want they want more have you got anything you got any more in you got another one in you and uh you know becky kind of goes uh no I'm, uh, that's all i've got I'm, I'm done and then we end with her you know cuddling her little daughter um so that's the movie but let's get into a bit more of a discussion because now because i think it's one of those movies where because the plot isn't very straightforward in the sense that there's not there's acts but it is more about the the character progression yeah it's it's, it's 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 literally yeah it's just it's very you're only seeing the key moments mm. in her life like you don't really get much background around that it's literally you're just seeing the the rise the fall the redemption that's kind of it yes and the redemption. With, yeah and I'm, yeah. I'm fine with that because you know and i think doing it in five parts was a good way of doing it because you mm. know you kind of very perfectly have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you have like the two sort of cornerstones uh, in between. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, I I think Becky something's a great character, lifted from you know several female musicians who are mm. quite notorious for their behaviors and stuff. And it was nice to see an exploration of those kinds of characters. The you know, like you say, they she wasn't constantly shown doing drugs and drinking. We because we already know that about. Yeah, her, we don't because need you look to look at the environment. Yeah. And, yeah. and I feel like the the substance abuse is treated as a symptom of the whole situation, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's not the cause. It's definitely not helping, but it's not the cause. Like, yeah. she's clearly got ideas above her station about you know how successful she is and how talented she is and how like you know she views herself as being the heart and soul of the band, which is literally something that she says at one point in the movie. And you definitely do get that with a lot of these uh, bands from that era. There, there definitely was a lot of ego. And a lot of people thinking that they were the whole band, again, Courtney Love springs to mind in that regard, because a lot of people stated that she very much said she was the heart and soul of Hole, but, you know, whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. But then, as the movie goes on, you do see that Becky Something is actually very talented musically, because Hmm. you get the scene, um, uh, in the scene where she's um, in the fourth act, where she's with her daughter, and she plays the song on the piano for her daughter because her daughter asks her can you play me a song that reminds you of me she plays heaven she... by not cascada yes. the uh, <laughs> original version yeah it wasn't cascada i think it was dj sammy that did that song oh, so and i don't know what i don't know why i know that <laughs> but yes. i do cascada um, i can see why you thought that though is it not cascada Okay, I'm then. sure it's dj sammy i'm sure it is well i'm sure we can drop in a fact checking goblin here <laughs> it's me again, the cheeky little fact-checking goblin. It turns out the boys are both kind of right. DJ Sammy released a version of Heaven in 2002. A later version was released by DJ Mannion and Cascada. The German DJ, Janau, worked on both versions, perhaps creating the initial confusion. <laughs> cheeky Eurodance facts. <laughs> Back to the show! I think I'm pretty sure the only reason I know that is because when uh, during my tenure working at CEX, uh, we used to have a guy always come in asking if we had any DJ Sammy albums because he just really <laughs> liked that song. Fair enough, <laughs> and I will never forget that man. Anyway, yeah, she plays Heaven. Yes, and it's a really really nice moment because again, like I said earlier, Elizabeth Moss plays the entire song on piano mm. and sings it to her daughter. And again, I like the fact that it's all one take, one continuous shot. She just plays the song. And yeah, there's a lot of long takes in this movie, which I think lends itself to this the overall style and story because you mentioned earlier sort of shakespearean comparisons mm. and i feel like you're definitely more well from what i gather you're a lot more sort of clued in on that sort of thing than me i've not really dipped my toe into shakespeare for many many a moon i've read a book <laughs> i've read a book <laughs> once yes uh but no i mean you can definitely see it with the structure of the movie the whole five act structure and yes. stuff like that's that's obviously uh, very much directly referencing there's that also the kind of um the thing that kind of uh piqued my interest in that regard is that in the first act we have this 
idea that the shaman has told Becky that her daughter will be her downfall. And, yes. Um, you know, so you have a very Shakespearean concept of the prophecy that becomes a, yeah, very almost Macbeth, a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy because ultimately um, her sort of love for her daughter is the downfall of Becky something but it becomes the birth of the real Becky in some regards. Or at least that's how I kind of interpret the ending, is like she's leaving behind the persona for good. Um, that's definitely how I view it as well, hmm. yeah. Is that, yeah, she's been told that, you know, the shaman does tell that, but it's it's, um, it's not a false prophecy, but it's uh, a misinterpreted one, hmm. which I always think is a, a slightly better way. If you have to do prophecies and things, that's kind of the better way to do it, I think. Yeah. Because, you know, prophecies a lot of the time are lazy shorthand ways of yeah. writing. Yeah. Um, but we won't get into that as much. But no, I, I like that, and I like that it actually means that the sort of weird mysticism stuff that Becky is into actually has a, like a proper bearing on the story. It's not just, mm. oh, this is how mad she is at this point in time, that she has a shaman that follows her around everywhere. Although we do later like because... find out that the shaman is in prison uh, because he swindled Because he's a fraud. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I like that as a little detail. I like that he wasn't entirely forgotten towards the end mm. of the film because like, his his influence on her is quite large and yeah. it rings through right until the end of the movie. Well, she's always talking um, about vision quests and seances and all that kind of bollocks. Uh, and the word witch comes up a lot as well. Yes, yeah, so, there's a lot you know, of imagery kind of, surrounding three witches in this movie. Yeah, so again, like, yeah, definitely can see like the Macbeth comparisons in there. And she explicitly calls the Akka girl. She says, um, I seem to have misplaced a drummer on my way to Grandma's house, but who should arrive but three witches? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is another example of how uh, Becky almost speaks in this kind of iambic pentameter as well. She kind of soliloquize this constantly yeah. <laughs> yeah and again and like and you could definitely see it in that sense that like she is kind of doing a soliloquy but everybody in the room is very aware of her doing it. yes because <laughs> yes. you just constantly have shots of people looking at her like is she okay what is she fucking talking about yeah 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 um yeah and i thought it was kind of interesting on the subject of her daughter being the uh the quote-unquote downfall right um because becky very much interprets that when we see her in when she's living in this kind of weird agoraphobic lifestyle in her country house house um the scottish bass player makes a reappearance uh who, and she's also recently gotten clean and they're kind of having what you imagine to be the first proper conversation they've had in some time um and they're kind of talking about the case uh, the bass player kind of says yeah, people you know want to hear the music that you might come up with on your own people want to know what the real becky something is and they have this kind of back and forth where they go uh, you know as a woman or she's a user she's a mother and they kind of back and forth it like that yeah i like that scene a lot yeah, and um, that's a really interesting scene because they also kind of posit this idea where she's like, where Becky says about, um, you know, oh, my love for my daughter ends up being my downfall. And the bass player says, well, no, your downfall was you never learn how to rely on other people. Which, Which is kind obviously of... harks back to earlier in the movie when mm. Becky, you know, says that she is the heart and soul of the band and that like she wrote all the songs and stuff. And obviously that's a lie. It's completely yeah. a lie. Yeah. Or at the very least... So it's worth noting, the bassist's name is Agnes. Which Agnes. <laughs> we, we've just been saying bassist and drummer this entire time. I feel like we've been doing those characters there's, a bit of a disservice. There's a lot um, of characters in this movie. Um, yeah. Ag- Agnes is the bassist, and the drummer is Ali. Ali, yes. He's Ali, Ali Van, Van, der Wolf. Van der Wolf. yeah. Van der Wolf um, and uh, well, that's Agnes another, D. That's uh, another very subtle... Oh, that's, that's, sorry, that's the actress's name. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the actress. Ag- Agnes. It's uh, Marielle Hell. Is the, yes, the that's right. Yeah, I was gonna say, I sorry, Agnes was, was the actress's name. I was going to say, I didn't so think sorry. there was an Agnes. But, uh, yeah, no, 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 Marielle Agnes, Hell. Yeah, Marielle Hell. Yeah, because that's kind of a subtle running joke throughout the movie is that all these bizarre stage names that these people have. Um, yes, we because Cara Delevingne plays Crassy Cassie, which yes, is a great Cassie name. Uh, and then Ashley Benson plays Roxy Rotten. Yeah. And then there's Dotty OZ is the yeah, other one. Yeah. And there's kind of Which is point, probably the worst of those names. There's a point where some character <laughs> expresses surprise that Zelda's real name is Zelda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, she's Zelda Ezekiel. Yeah, is. Zelda Ezekiel, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they have some fun with the names. I think that's something that is it's a subtle point about persona and kind of how yeah, people act absolutely. when they're being observed. Because that's another thing as well. When we were first introduced to uh, Dirtbag Danny, um, the, the other girls... Uh, Mariella and um, Ali Vanderwolf. Uh, Ali, Ali, Ali Vanderwolf. Uh, they uh, they're kind of teasing him when he comes in and they're calling him, you know, Dirtbag Danny and all this and and kind of go, you know, and they kind of use one of his slogans from the old radio show and uh, he kind of says like, oh, come on, no one no one calls me that anymore and 
you know, they have the repeat of that when he meets the Aka girls as well, where they're kind of talking about his, they're going, oh, we used to listen to your show, man, he's so cool and all this. And he, you know, and they're kind of teasing him about his catchphrase and stuff, and he's saying, like, yeah, yeah, very funny, very funny. So you kind of see that, like, that's a persona that he's left behind already. Yeah, absolutely, because um, you get the in the that, cast list of the film, he's credited as Danny something. Yeah, that's, that's an uh, interesting yeah. detail, I thought, because... um you know that's not a name they use for him in the uh script as far as i'm aware um mm. or he's never referred to as that he's always just referred to as dan danny or dirtbag danny and you assume that becky something is a stage name not her married <laughs> name presumably it's not the in the i don't know if i'm going to pronounce this correctly but i've got it up on my screen here um because her actual name is rebecca adamski or i'm sorry if i'm butchering that but... uh, yeah it's a polishy name that's why yeah, I, yeah. I, I, di- I didn't even try to uh, to pronounce it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very very sorry if I butchered that, but yeah, because it's spelled A D A M C Y Z K. So that's her. It's actual a chick, name. isn't it? It's like Adam Chick or something they say in the movie, but it's, yeah, something, something like, like that. that. I can't fully I can't fully remember what they refer to her as in the movie because she's always just called Becky something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's her real name. So I would assume that the something is just to show that Dan tie them together, I guess, yeah, because presumably yeah. Dan because, I mean, you, you never find out the origin of her surname. Uh, there's almost a pe- show level of unexplained nicknames in this film. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they kind of... I, I would assume she got that name because people couldn't pronounce her last name. So it's a play, yeah, it's a play that's, on that. Yeah. I think that is... Yeah, I think that's the reason why. Anyway, we're getting, and also very, she... we're getting very bogged down in stage names <laughs> But I, was, I feel like it might also be because, you know, when she talks about herself in, uh, with uh, Marielle, mm. when they're doing the whole, oh, who, who is she? Who is she? It feels like before she was in bands, Becky didn't know who she was. Mm. So that, I feel like the Becky something is like part of that, like her not knowing what her identity is. Like yeah, the something yeah, is, definitely. yeah, is alluding to that idea of not finding herself. Yeah. And she does say, you know, no one's seen that sort of real her since she was 16 or something. Yeah, she's been lost absolutely. in kind of playing this role for for a long but, time. But going back to the the fifth act, which I I would probably say is definitely the for me the best part of the movie, and there's a lot of part, really good parts of this movie. But so I think that's the, my favorite this part. This is the because... uh, the comeback uh, one song at yeah. the uh, the celebration of Howard's record label. Yeah. And what I really liked about this, and this compared to a lot of other films about bands and musicians and stuff, is that. It, they don't go like this is it this is your shot again it's like no no this is just one song it's all it is yeah you it's know. about the and personal even the, victory not the uh, not the financial yeah. success or what have you yeah and even then this is not a huge stadium gig either no. it's just in like a club or something and I like the fact that even though it's just a one song thing this to Becky this is kind of everything mm. for everybody else this is just a, a road bump uh, particularly Zelda, who's just kind of swanning around, not really caring about <laughs> <Yes>. it. <laughs> God, I almost wish that character wasn't played by Amber Heard because I find the character so entertaining. But, um, uh, my, my own misgivings of Amber Heard aside, I mean, I think she is quite good in this. She is. And, she is. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I've always been a big fan of Drive Angry as well. I've got to throw that out. Yeah, there. we love Drive Angry here at Kino. We do love Drive Angry. Certified I feel like not enough Kino. people love Drive Angry. <laughs> Certified but... Kino. Absolutely. It's just a shame that Amber Heard is a garbage person. Yes. Yeah, look at it. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I think the position of this podcast is that Johnny Depp is also a garbage person. Uh, yeah. Just to be absolutely. Clear. Yeah, they are both garbage people. Yeah, so, um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you about the last act. I actually think the whole movie is very impressive, but I think the last act to me is what really seals it. Um, both in terms of the direction and Elizabeth Moss's performance. Because I think when you see her on, on stage and she's performing for a crowd for the first time, first of all, you have the absolute stress of thinking she's going to wander off and do drugs with all these random yeah. people. And there's that Which... whole sequence where Ali and uh, Muriel can't find her. And they're obviously like, oh, shit. Like, she goes missing yeah. for five minutes and they're freaking out. Um, yeah, uh- and yeah. I feel like because of because of the way the film set up previously, and like like I said at the start of us talking about, it, it's like you know each scene kind of like winds up before it goes off. Yeah. And due to everything you've seen previously with you know um, Becky smashing a bottle and going to <laughs> yeah, stab going to Alley, alley. Yeah. like yeah. you know, 
in a lot of other films you go no 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 she'll pull through it's you know she's gonna she's gonna do the show i genuinely wasn't convinced of that in no this i film. wasn't either. i was like i was i feel like this could go either way i feel like she's either gonna go it completely really, off the rails and they're gonna find her dead in a toilet or... it really earns that final slightly cheesy final kick whereas i think a lot of I other didn't... movies i think a lot of other movies it would feel cheesy because you'd be going, yeah, oh, I'd, yeah I'd, you know. I'd agree. Yeah, I don't think they go full cheese of it. I don't because every time I thought they were going to, they didn't. I think probably the only cheesy part of it is that she brings all the other girls on stage. Yeah, but, yeah. but even then, like, I don't think that was too cheesy because, you know, unlike a lot of these other movies where they do that, they don't sound perfect. No. Because you know she's just brought these women on stage to do a song with her, and clearly like only a few of them know the song. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it's about like, kind of like you know the camaraderie and like she's finally accepting people into her life, and she's yeah, actually and she's, you know, you collaborating know, with people, recognizing and... the importance that all these people have had in her life. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's uh, set up by the little séance scene she does beforehand. Where yes, and I like right. the fact that she has that. I do like that scene as well because even though like the shaman is a fraud and is in prison he still had something of a positive effect on yeah, her. Like, yeah. everybody that she surrounds herself with in that movie she has had some form of positive That's effect. That's a great scene her. as well, because it ends with her saying, you know, you're all there for me uh, until the very end. And then she leaves, and you have that moment where Mariel is like, well, what do you mean by that? What do you think she mean by that? Yeah, that, that what was did the we just do moment here? for me. Yeah. Yeah, that was, def- that was definitely the point where I was like, oh, no. Yeah, where, <laughs> I was like, her daughter this, is there. <laughs> what, where could this be going? Yeah. Um, yeah. I also like though that you, when she gets on to perform, you see her trying to almost latch back onto the Becky persona for one last night, and, and uh, she manages it. She briefly manages it, yeah. But obviously, she can't do it alone. And uh, I do like that she still manages to get some jibes in uh, towards Howard. <laughs> yeah, I, I, because I, I, one of the things that I like is that at that point in the movie, she definitely makes a distinction between herself and Becky something as a character. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, I've I, I feel like a lot of rock stars don't. Yeah, weirdly, this you know. movie, as much as it's about the '90s and about um kind of girl rockers, the real life rocker it made me think of the most was Alice Cooper in a weird way. Same, yeah. same. Though, again, you know, not only because you know, big super fan of the guy here, yeah. but yeah, I definitely got the, I definitely got that idea because you know, Alice Cooper himself says that his stage persona is a character that yeah. he is a separate entity to. And he's talked about how when that. he got clean from drink and all sorts yeah part of it was finding that distinction between character and person and, you know, yeah he said his first show after getting clean was the most terrifying show of his life because he used to go out on stage as alice and he'd been drinking prior and like, he hadn't done that before so the idea of going out on stage and having alice take over was so foreign to him yeah yeah and yeah if i definitely saw that kind of parallel Mm. between the two and I, again i wouldn't be surprised if that was completely intentional as well because there's it's very scarily to his words what happens yes yeah yeah but then again, I, that's a very famous story in rock music so i would i would like the thing about alex ross perry and his movies is that they're very underseen so they're under talked about so a lot of the thematic stuff we're trying to kind of pass from this we are kind of coming off from the top of our heads other people have made the shakespearean comparison um, and I wanted to kind of throw this out there as another uh, example of that. Obviously, we've got the false prophecy. We've got several groups of three witches in this. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have soliloquizing constantly, but we also have uh, the play within the play when the cameras are following her around when she's supposed to be doing the opening gig for uh, the Acker Girls. And we have that moment of her playing up to the cameras in a very kind of meta way. <laughs> Where she's playing yep. up to the cameras, but obviously she's also, we know that she's not playing up that much. That's just kind of what you'd be like yeah. if the cameras weren't there in the first place. I, I lo- yeah, I like the moments where she plays up to the camera and then she'll just suddenly shrink back slightly and then just talk to people on a normal level. Yeah. And yeah. then just go straight back into this character. I think that, like, again, just credit to Elizabeth Moss. Yeah. She's, a, just, a she's magnetic in this film. She's electric. Yeah. I mean, she's yeah. worked with Perry a few times. I think it's the third film they've done together. Um, so clearly they have a good working relationship. I think she's a producer on this film as well. Um, but yeah, the performance is, is crazy. And when I, I know when I saw it for the first time, I was like, I can't believe I've not heard more about this. 
I until you suggested it for this show, mm. I'd never heard of it, and that's saying something as somebody who you know genuinely does sort of follow a lot of what Elizabeth Moss does because she's just always impressive. Like, she's one of those actors that I can't wait to see what she does next. I wouldn't have heard of it if I, I hadn't him. seen some of his other movies. What else did he do? I know he's done something notable. Um, well, they're all very indie movies. Um, the ones that I've seen are there's the the Color Wheel, um, Listen Up, Philip with uh, Elizabeth Moss again, and uh, Jason Schwartzman. He also did Queen of Earth with Elizabeth Moss. Which, the um, one I was thinking of, because I've just looked him up, uh, this is very different to the rest of his stuff, he did Christopher Robin. Yes, he did write Christopher <laughs> Robin, yes. Uh, ah, right, yes. Yeah. I knew he was involved in something quite yes. big. Um, he can I also, uh, for movie podcast fans, frequently be heard as a guest on the Blank Check podcast, where he is oh, okay. famous for making the episodes go on for significantly longer than uh, other episodes of the show. <laughs> Oh, I wonder what that must be like. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I think he's a really, uh, really interesting filmmaker. All of his movies kind of have the similar theme of sort of, um, I don't want to say unlikable characters, but sort of misanthropic, uh, flawed characters. Flawed characters. One that we should definitely cover on the movie, and you should definitely watch if you're an Elizabeth Moss fan, is Queen of Earth. Um, okay, I'll definitely stick that on. Queen my of list. Earth is kind of a ninety-minute version of. Um, all the scenes in this that are just ratcheting up and ratcheting up, but it's doing that across the space of ninety minutes. And, okay, um, I mean, I could be into that because that that is probably it's weird for me to say this is a flaw I have with her smell, even though I still really really liked it. Is I think it is a little bit long, and yes. due to its structure, I feel like it does take its time kind of getting to the real sort of core of the movie because that fifth act is the real sort of centerpiece for the yeah. movie. The you know the the third act where she's going crazy backstage with the film crew and then she gets handcuffed and still goes out on stage and tries mm. playing Tyler. That's great. But it's the the finale that really makes the movie. And yeah. the you know the I feel like if you can't really get into the world of and the characters of this movie in the first two acts, you're really gonna struggle to see it through the third and fourth, I think. Yeah, it's a challenging film for sure. Yeah, particularly Particularly if you've not got a high tolerance f- for films where people are just horrible to each other a lot. Yeah. I, I Thankfully, say, I love that kind of stuff. Um, I will say, yeah, on the rewatch, I was a bit, um, you know, kind of pushed for time and wishing the movie would sort of get towards the end. But um, I will say, I don't think that fourth and fifth act would land in the same way if we have. No, you do need it. Yeah, we do need that yeah. long, kind of protracted descent into complete depravity. So I think if you didn't have that, the redemption would seem a bit trite. Whereas I think yeah, completely. When you have it, and you have the kind of the scene where you're not sure is she going to top herself, is she going to go and do drugs and fuck it all up, and you know, I think you need that, and you need to believe that she might. You know, you need yeah, to believe that she might s- be in the toilet sniffing coke off someone's ass right now. Yeah, and they definitely yeah, they earn it. They 100 percent earn it. Mm. So that I think. I, I say it's a negative, but I, it's not a negative for me. I think for some people, it yeah. may be a little bit too slow. This is to not really a film for going. everyone, that's for sure. No, not like, you know, I wouldn't recommend this in the same way that I would Hedvig, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. I think Hedvig... Also, I mean, Hedvig's a much more enjoyable <laughs> film. Yeah, I think her smell is very, um, like Shakespeare in a way, you kind of have to dial into its wavelength. And if you can get... Yeah, I'd say I would 100% watch this again but I'd have to be in the mood for it. Well, I think we've uh, we've shot our load early, but do you, what do we think? Kino or Inferno? I'm going to say Kino. I really liked it. It spoke to a lot of my own sort of sensibilities. I liked that it had the sort of Shakespearean undercurrent to it because, you know, I did sort of notice that stuff. It was only when you pointed out that I was like, ah, there we go. Everything kind of clicks together now. I see it. Um, yeah, I see I see a lot more of that now. It was mostly like the, the constant use of the word witch that kept sort of going. I was like, mm. three women witches. Okay, there's something here. Uh, no, really, really liked it. Um, would recommend it to a lot of people. Uh, just, you know, strap yourself in for it because you know, you've got two hours and 15 minutes. And it does. it's a film that likes to sort of creep along and then out of nowhere kind of ramp up the tension of it. I, think you I know, liked that a lot. I think you know if this movie's for you within 20 minutes, though. Like, by the time you get through that first kind of long take journey through the sort of backstage of the gig and then you have... You know the, the the baby ending up in the dangerous situation, and 
Yeah, I think by the time you've seen her collapse with her, her baby in her arms and vomiting all over the floor and herself, I think that's the point where you know whether you want to hit the stop button or whether you want to continue watching the movie. <laughs> Definitely, because there's there's going to be people out there that are going to see that scene and go, I can't, I can't much. watch the rest yeah, of this. This yeah. it's too horrible. I don't, yeah. yeah. They and I feel like for some people as well, um, they're just going to hate Becky as yeah. a character. They're going to absolutely loathe her, and you know, I can see why she's a detestable person. But I liked her. <laughs> you know, yeah, I found her interesting to watch. I found her development and growth across the movie really interesting to see. I think it's safe to say you know, we've I'm, both known a few Beckys in our lifetime as well. Yeah. So I, yeah, I find completely. this movie pretty uh, pretty easy to relate to. Um, yeah. Um, I feel like if I'm anyone in this movie, I am a bit more dirtbag bunny than anyone else. I feel like I, <laughs> I'm the guy who's like, I don't know why I brought the new girlfriend and the baby, but look, I need you to sign these papers, please, for the love of God. Um, please help me out. I, yeah. I feel I'm a bit more of a, a bit more of a Marielle myself. I yeah, you're definitely baby. Marielle doing bumps of coke <laughs> in the toilet. That is slander. <laughs> <laughs> That's actual slander. That, that you was just a joke. If what culture are listening, that was a joke. <laughs> I'll, s- I'll see you in court. <laughs> Grot culture. So, what are your thoughts? I mean, you probably already, you know, laid that out uh, there, but you know, yeah, I mean, up. controversially, it's another double Kino. Um, Bit of a pattern emerging here. We've, isn't got, we've had no Inferno so far. Next time, I'm no. going to have to trash whatever film you bring to the the podium just to have some inferno on the record we just need to stop picking good films i think that's the main thing yeah i mean we, we also i think we're the only people who care about our entirely arbitrary rating system oh um, absolutely it's just purely for us no i would say this is kino i like uh, alex ross perry's movies anyway because i like movies about white people being awful to each other and i think this Preach. is i think this is um his best film by a considerable margin um, although That's I've, interesting to know. Although I've not seen, I've, I've seen. not seen Golden Exits actually, but um, we should definitely cover the color wheel on this podcast, and you definitely shouldn't read the, uh, anything about it because it's one of those okay. movies where it's a comedy. Uh, it's a, it's a dark comedy about um, uh, a brother and sister going on a road trip to pick up her shit from a much older ex, and it just goes to some places. We don't need to go into it. Here, but, um, <laughs> okay, that sounds like my kind of vibe. I'm into. Um, Yes, and the two characters of that are absolutely awful as well. Um, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of his MO, I think. But um, I mean, we've been doing a lot of those films, haven't we? We've just been doing films about awful people doing awful things. Yes, watching so, this, I, I was thinking of, of uh, I was thinking of Withnell actually. This would have been a good one. To it's Withnell meets Spinal Tap in a way, isn't yeah, it? Like, yeah, kind of, it's it's it's, wi- it's Withnell in the setting of Spinal Tap. It's a callback to uh, Episode One. It's deliberate that. Hmm. Yeah, so I I feel like these have been two quite good films to contrast with one another because you know they do center around like uh like persona like female personas in rock music, mm. but they're two very opposite ends of the spectrum. In the you know Hedvig's a lot more joyous, and even though that does go into some sort of darker territory, there's still like a note of optimism and hope throughout Hedvig. Yeah, and yeah. you do get that in her smell as well, but it her smell is much more like bogged down in just the the awfulness for the majority of its runtime yeah it really makes you work for that optimism (laughs) yeah exactly whereas you know within the first five minutes of hedvig you get like a a sense of triumph you know the opening song is basically saying that hedvig herself is like the berlin wall and you you know you have to try and tear her down Mm, she even wears a costume of the berlin wall (laughs) you know so the the yeah one's and again i like the fact that both films do start on like a, a song as well yes uh, to sort of ease you into that those worlds but you know one hedvig's much more upbeat and her smell was a bit more sign of doom to come that's what i'd say yes yeah, so i think it's very telling that they chose uh, to cover a song that starts with the line i always flirt with death <laughs> yes. that is very much a sign of things to come it sets the tone doesn't yes. it yes well mark we've discussed two films now it's time to end the podcast (laughs) (laughs) um look by this point you know listeners that we don't know what the social media is so um (laughs) but now um from from all the people here at kino inferno stay safe (laughs) have a good one it's a uh everything's on fire it's just you know keep yes. yourself safe guys stay safe for god's sake be honest with each other 
I don't, I don't just, know what that is. That's advice. For God's just, sake, just be, be safe. Together. Just just be safe and look after yourselves because if you don't, we no one's listening to this show. So yeah. do it for us. I thought you were going to say what? if we don't, if you don't, we'll come at you. <laughs> I'm not going to threaten people. <laughs> listen, if you don't listen to this, I'll come at you. It's, if they've made it this far, then they're committed and we love them. So I'm I'm standing in support of these people. See you next time, guys. <laughs>